Call to order the meeting of the Board of Managers of Minnehaha Creek Watershed District, October 22nd. Nine, uh, it's not 19 at all, 2015. <laughs> wow. Back it's back to the future, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I got caught up in yesterday. Um, uh, all managers are present except Manager Olson, Manager Rognes, and Manager Shackleton. Um, is there anyone here, a member of the public, who wishes to address the Board on a matter that is either not on the agenda or that is on the consent agenda. See no hands. Um, for the agenda, I note a few changes. Um, we're going to move item 8.1B to 12.1 and add two reports under 8.1, uh, the Metro Mod meeting and the Citizens Advisory Council. And the third change is We'll reverse the order of 13 and 14 so that the closed session comes at the end of the meeting. With those changes, are there any others? Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Move approval. Second. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, Ma Ma Commissioner Callison, I gave you the wrong title. Good to see you. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you, President White and uh, managers and staff. I'm pleased you've given me some time on your agenda to talk a little bit about Hennepin County. And I jotted down five items I thought you might find interesting, but I'm always open to your questions and your comments. So um, as I go along, if I'm not clear or you want more information, have other questions, just let me know. I thought I'd start with Bush Away, uh, two transportation projects. Uh, that project is uh, coming to the end of the construction season, so by the end of November, they'll probably be about done working. It's been a great fall. There are two important elements that will not be done at that point. One is the railroad bridge on uh, North and McGinty, and the second is the curve at Breezy Point in Woodland and Minnetonka. So after they wrap up construction this year, uh, the road will be open from Minnetonka Boulevard to McGinty. Um, it'll be paved, so you'll be able to get into YZ the way we always used to get into YZ. <coughs> and uh, over the winter they'll be figuring out what the staging is for next spring when they'll have to redo or they'll have to start construction back up again. So the curve will not be done at that point. There will be construction that will be necessary next spring and perhaps summer uh, for the south and the railroad bridge will not be done either. So 
completion of construction is still summer 2016. Date's not clear, but um, clearly we've made a lot of progress over the um, summer on a very difficult project and one you've been partners on. So thank you for the work on that. I also thought I would mention Southwest LRT. You've also been involved with that. And uh, we've made progress on that as well. So we successfully cut, uh, reduced the budget, still keeping the project, we believe, competitive. We've received approval from all the localities, the county and the cities. And uh, we'll be moving forward with the um, federal application or the federal documentation, if you will. We believe it's still a very um, competitive project federally. We hope by the, uh, I think, fourth quarter of 2016 to have the full funding grant agreement from the federal government. That's really the approval to move forward. If that happens, we'll start, um, we'll have a line open in, in 2020. Mm -hmm. So um, five years away if all goes well. Then I wanted to let you know a little bit about our um, demand for services in Hennepin County. As you may know, we provide social services for the state of, of Minnesota. Minnesota is one of a handful of states where the counties administer the social service system. And 40% uh, of our budget relates to health and human services. <coughs> We have seen a substantial increase in client loads in Hennepin County. From 2010 to 2014, the number of clients increased by 42%. Uh, that relates, I believe, less to the economy than it does to changes in programming. And if you look at how those numbers break down, you would see that in general, uh, requests for welfare assistance haven't necessarily changed a whole lot. Requests for food stamps haven't necessarily changed a whole lot. But when you get to health um, services, uh, Medicaid expansion, long-term care assessments as the senior population grows, changes that which say that prior, in prior years, we could have nonprofits do those assessments, now the county must do it. All those things mean that the caseloads have gone up, even though I don't think there's a corresponding decline, if you will, in, in economic conditions. So we're looking at increased numbers of cases uh, we are proposing, as you may know, a budget a property tax increase next year of 4.5%. Um, and even though our caseloads are up, if the state covers the cost of those cases, we don't need a property tax increase. But we don't expect the state will be covering the cost of all those cases. So long-term care assessments, they do. Um, child protection, which is also an area where we're adding workers and standards are changing, state standards and county standards it doesn't look like they will cover the cost of those standards. So in a variety of, of different areas, we'll be looking at more cases. We'll be looking at a property tax increase related to the caseloads, related to decreases in state funding, related to contract negotiations that are underway with our employees. That's our preliminary um, assessment. That 4.5 was the amount recommended by the county administrator, adopted by the board. My guess is it'll stay pretty close to that, but we'll be going through the truth and taxation process. We're still hearing from some of our um, departments. And so we'll know in early December um, what the property tax labor will be. And of course, it varies by um, house, by property in Hennepin County. Um, my district, which is the western suburbs, Minnetonka being about central, will probably see a bigger impact than other areas of the county because property values have been stronger here. And so the burden will shift a little bit. The final thing I wanted to mention to you is watershed management. As you know, at the end of the legislature last year, there was a bill um, introduced or supported by my colleague Commissioner Jeff Johnson to reorganize watershed governance in the state of Minnesota. I understand he intends to re reintroduce that bill or has a sponsor for it. I believe it would make Hennepin County a pilot. So it wouldn't be asking to reorganize the whole state. It would be looking at watershed management in Hennepin County and asking the legislature to make some changes to that. So I wanted to let you know about that. You might be watching for it as the uh, legislative session unwinds. That completes the items I brought with me. As I say, I'm happy to take your questions, and I appreciate the time and the agenda and the work that you're doing. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Commissioner. You're welcome. Are there questions? Manager, please. Would the county be supporting that legislation as part of your lobbying um, initiatives? I don't know the answer to that. We adopt a platform. We usually do that early in the calendar year, so 2016. He had proposed something uh, similar in previous years. The county board was not particularly supportive of that. I don't believe that that has changed. We haven't asked the question, so at this point, I don't know. OK. Thank you. Other questions? Somebody set their hand up out there. Um, we have a very busy agenda, so I think I'll say no. But thank I you very much, I can take it in the hallway Weir. afterwards. That's, Sweet. That's OK. You get a private audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, You're Commissioner. Welcome. It's always good to see you. Thank you.
<clears throat> on the consent agenda, we have approval of the October 8th, 2015 board minutes, approval of check registers for the general checking account, the surety account, and the 325 Lake Road checking account, and we have resolution 15-086, authorization to hire Smith Partners as district council for 1617, resolution 15-087, <clears throat> Authorization to hire Wank Associates as district engineer for 1617. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is second. there a second? Any questions? Man Mr. S um, Welch. Could um, managers, would you uh, consider removing, please, item 6 1, the general checking account, for a brief business mm -hmm. matter related to that? Uh, please re reflect that in the motion. Mm -hmm. I'll move that to 11.1. Um, <coughs> With that change, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Uh, I already signed the check, so I'd like to know why I'm made aware of Council's interest in the general checking now. I didn't know there was a problem. Madam Chair and Managers, there's a check in the register for which the authorization needs to be confirmed as some expenses were incurred apparently beyond what was authorized by the manager, so we wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Um, I could address it now and you could leave it on consent and go ahead and yeah, leave it alone. Let's, let's do this. Um, so that's fine. The issue is check 36091 and staff in the course of completing the uh, very complicated and detailed what uh, uh, creek cleanup project incurred expenses on the fly and added a roughly, well not roughly, exactly $3,995.97 to the authorization that was approved by the board in May. And so we just wanted to make sure that the board authorized that additional expense. Okay, a brief motion to that effect would cover you. All right, you got a motion? Is there a second? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you I, making I a motion? I haven't heard the motion. I'll move that. There is a motion. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. So, that can stay there. Please let the motion reflect that. Yeah. The original motion. Okay. Thank you, managers. Under board reports, um, my president's report, I have two items to report. One is that I chaired the planning advisory committee for the comp plan earlier this week. It's well attended and there's good participation. Our staff presented um, a number of items, including an overview of the strategic plan, I'm sorry, the um, comprehensive plan process. And a lot of the questions that were asked by participants were around questions of ways that we can collaborate and, and everyone was in agreement that, that um, on both sides all the LGUs are very eager to um, continue to work together. Uh, the second item is that I've been requested by the, invited by the city of uh, Wyzetta to participate in the steering committee uh, for their lake effect signature project. And I um, requesting that the board would appoint me as liaison under our liaison policy, which is attached to the board packet, um, to sit on that steering committee. So moved. Second. <coughs> With all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you very much. I will, of course, report back as our liaison policy calls. Um, the next item is planning and policy committee report. Uh, Manager Calkins. Um, again, we have uh, very complete minutes in the packet again, so I won't go into great detail. Uh, we discussed uh, three primary items. One was the 2016 budget mm -hmm. refinements and a um, resolution to that effect. Um, uh, to the full board was made, which we will be dealing with later on, on the agenda. We also uh, talked uh, additionally about the comprehensive plan framework, and we talked about South Katrina Marsh easements, and a motion this was in uh, passed in support of um, acquiring those easements that was passed on to the board as well. Thank you. Um, I don't think we have a CAC report. We'll put that off. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Mamayak is here and we'll give that report.
President White Managers, the CAC meeting was actually uh, pretty brief uh, this past uh, month. There was one project that was before the CAC and it was a cost share project for a property on Minnewashta Parkway in Excelsior on the Chanhassen border. Rick and Judy Berland, they approved a cost share project to extend their buffer area, which will be very much uh, more visible to neighbors and from Lake Minnewashta. And that uh, project is not to exceed $1,600, uh, $1,638. They uh, got an update on past projects, the Parkway Place townhomes. The staff toured that project uh, earlier uh, in the month. Rain gardens, permeable pavers, new water management median are all part of the feature there. And mm -hmm. they've been installed and plantings were in progress when staff were there. That's set to be complete by um, the end of the week. Um, one of the CAC members suggested inviting <coughs> Terry Hamming in to present and speak on the success of that project and the community engagement piece in particular and uh, how he got community buy-in for that project there at Parkway Place. And uh, a couple of other, the uh, Shirk Tikva Synagogue, 200 people were in attendance at the grand opening there and uh, Brett Item, our cost share administrator, was among them. Students helped with planting of rain gardens there, and they installed four rain gardens. Master Water Stewards and Brett Items spoke at the opening, and that occurred on October 10th. And the up other update was on the Kenwood Elementary School Rain Garden Project, uh, that there was a video on public television of how the project has worked its way into the school's curriculum. All grades will revisit the project in some way during the science classes that they take at the school. And then the CAC got an update on the Six Mile Creek sub-watershed planning process from Anna Brown and also got an overview of the permitting staff and uh, program from Tom Dietrich and Catherine Sylvia. There was an update on the Cynthia Krieg grant application process. The grant uh, cycle did close last Friday and uh, now staff and the CAC will be reviewing those over the coming month and they will be coming to the board in December. And uh, some special items to address by the CAC and staff before the next meeting are CAC appointments. And uh, by the end of the year, current CAC members are asked to express their interest in serving on the CAC again in the coming year, and applications will be uh, sought from the public as well. And that pretty much summarizes what happened at the CAC this week, this morning. Thank you very much. Any questions? <clears throat> Final item is the uh, report from Metro Maud. Um, managers Olson and Blix were there, and I was there briefly. Would either of you like to give the report? I can. Thank you. Uh, we saw presentations from the Department of Health, Minnesota Department of Health, on water uh, reuse issues, uh, specifically potable water and the many uh, different ranks or uh, levels of that uh, type of a product. Uh, also recovering rainwater and stormwater uh, that would allow uh, irrigation, for example. One of the largest uh, installations is the uh, stadium where the Twins play. Uh, we also um, had a presentation from the Minnesota River Basin uh, project uh, where they're looking at the negative impacts of the <coughs> Minnesota River content. Fifteen percent of what we put into that river gets to the Gulf of Mexico, believe it or not. Mm. and. Um, so they're, they're very sensitive about how much runoff is, uh, is going in there. The other thing, too, is that within the next 50 years, if everything continues the way it is, Lake Pepin will be about two feet deep. It settles out when it gets to Lake Pepin, for mm -hmm. the most part. So there's, uh, there's some real issues going on there. And finally, we had uh, information that came from surface water uh, projects. The uh, state of Minnesota and the DNR are going to have a report uh, shortly, uh, early December, that details the negative impacts of surface water projects. And we've got a lot of that in the news lately where there's contamination of you know, vast areas of wells with nitrates and things like that. So uh, they'll be submitting a formal report. Thank you. Got your next. Just on that note, the, the <coughs> report is to go, was requested by the legislature, um, mm -hmm. and it is about the groundwater surface water interactions and um, <coughs> while uh, watersheds were not invited to participate in the group <coughs> initially and the group that started meeting about six months ago um, they just were invited and so um, uh, somebody from lower men um, is 
going to be the representation there. And then I also wanted to, just a tag to say that um, while it wasn't presented there, um, it was presented to, we had a Clean Water Council meeting this week and then these were available at the Metro Mod meeting, so I'm gonna pass them out. And this is the Environmental Quality Board um, uh, status quo report, uh, policy report, with regards to water. And um, I thought it was had a lot of good information in it, and it was really fairly well done, and I thought it might be worthwhile for us to um, take some time in the near future to um, uh, look at it as a group and discuss some of the policy goals um, that they've come up with um, um, at the state level. And so, thank you. Are there any other events or meetings managers have attended that upon which they'd like to report? Thank you. Um, 8.2 on our agenda list, our upcoming meeting and event schedule through the end of the calendar year. Um, for your review. Um, we are at item 9.1, Lake Minnetonka Zebra Mussel Study Presentation, Mr. Fieldseth and Mr. McComas. Thank you, President White Managers. Um, so zero muscles were discovered in Lake Mentaka in 2010. Uh, 2011, the district worked with Steve McComas from Blue Water Science to develop a study that would track the zero muscle population over time in the lake, as well as uh, assess changes in water quality conditions that may occur. Um, it has now been five years of zero muscles in Lake Minnetonka. Uh, we have a very large data set of zero muscle data and water quality data in the lake. Um, We'll be working with Mr. McComas throughout the winter on uh, writing up this data in a, in a paper for publication. Um, and we're also selected to present this data at the North American Lake Management Society Conference, uh, which is in New York later this November. Um, so tonight we're going to give you kind of the highlights of the presentation that we'll be giving at that conference. So I'll let Steve from there. Okay, well, thanks, Eric. And again, uh, it's always a pleasure to share our findings with the President and the Board. So we'll just get started. We're, these are just the highlights of our presentation, and also this is a draft. So we are certainly open to comments and critiques and additional information. Well, for an international group, we'll give them uh, the location map. The uh, North American Lake Management Society does have participants from really around the world. One of the things that we'll be talking about are the lake trophic categories and if you're not familiar with them, we have three. We call lakes, lakes can be classified either as oligotrophic, which is the clearest water, mesotrophic, which is moderately fertile and uh, still has clear water, and then eutrophic, which is usually pretty murky due to a lot of algae growth. Well, prior to zebra mussel uh, colonization and spreading, we looked at a three-year average of water quality in Lake Minnetonka. And what we did is we classified it based on these trophic conditions. So the green squares in the lake represent mesotrophic conditions, that's moderately fertile. And then the yellow and red squares indicate eutrophic conditions in Lake Minnetonka. And what we find is that the eastern side of the lake is generally mesotrophic and the western side is a bit more fertile, has uh, more algae and is more eutrophic. So these were the conditions prior to uh, zebra mussels coming in to Lake Minnetonka. So like Eric mentioned, they were observed in July, and by the end of August, we had found that they had spread, or they were fairly uh, common uh, in mostly the eastern side of the lake, and that's shown with those red, those red dots. Well, um, let's see here, yes. So, the question was, after the end of 2010, and we had the winter to kind of work up uh, some planning and some plans, that the questions were, well, what type of zebra, mu zebra mussel growth might we expect in Lake Minnetonka, and how might the lake change? 
So with that as kind of our working guidelines, a very comprehensive program was put into place to monitor zebra mussels and to look at uh, lake changes. To start out with, uh, zebra mussels generally have things they need to grow for optimal, optimal growth conditions. There's three, three kind of groupings. The shell formation factors and calcium is the critical component there. They need that for their shell production. Food factors, they need food and they need the right type of algae and usually that is unicellular algae and that will optimize their growth potential. And also they need surfaces to attach to and usually hard surfaces are the optimal surfaces for that. So those three factors to consider, we can make some predictions on what zebra mussels might do in Lake Minnetonka. The shell formation factors, the primary parameter there to look at is calcium. Uh, the Watershed District staff sampled all 26 bays in Lake Minnetonka over the course of a growing season and the results were that calcium was high enough to support optimal growth of zebra mussels in all areas of the lake. The substrate factors, that had to do with how much hard surface is present in each of these bays and that the optimal surface is rocks and, and woody, and woody um, structure and things like that. For the most part, Lake Minnetonka Bottom is dominated by sand and silty sand and maybe some muck. One of the things that we found over the course of this project was, however, zebra mussels perceive aquatic plants and those stems to also be a hard surface. So this factor is probably still in draft. We will probably modify this before the presentation because we're finding that the plants are getting loaded up with zebra mussels. They offer a un, an, uh, previously kind of an unknown substrate for, for growth. However, the key factor typically has been the amount of food that is available. And so based on the information that was collected in the past by the watershed district staff, we put together this map. And that is the algae that is optimal for growth is typically unicellular, these single-celled algae that they can easily filter and then use that for growth. They do not do very well in systems that have too many blue-green algae because they're usually in filaments or they don't do very well in systems where the algae is so scarce there's their food limited right off the bat right off the bat in Lake Minnetonka you can see that the uh, algae distribution is optimal in the eastern side of the lake there's a band in there where there's a uh, moderate potential and then in the more eutrophic bays on the western side it has a low potential for for growth because it's dominated by blue green algae they just can't ingest so if this is a basis we we're wondering too if this if we could maybe uh, predict how zebra mussels might do in the lake well here's 2010 it's uh by the end of 2010 there was not much density data but we knew that the distribution was primarily in the western side of lake minnetonka eastern, eastern. eastern side that's right <laughs> so that was at the end of 2010 I'll, I'm sure I'll do that again before we're done. But, so we had distribution data, but we didn't know really how many there were. Watershed District staff put together these plate samplers and a program to monitor zebra mussels based on how many would attach to these plate samplers over, you know, spread around the lake. They looked at the samplers on a monthly basis and also checked them at the end of the season where they had one sampler that was just put in early in the year and then not checked to the end and looked at the number of zebra mussels on this plate. And because we know the area of the plate, we could get a number of zebra mussels per meter squared, which would be a, some way to quantitatively assess zebra mussel densities. So these plates then were put in in 2011. However, in 2011, this hadn't really been done on this, on this scale, certainly not in Minnesota and rarely in other places. So we found, we, we learned a lot. And in fact, we kind of looked at 2011 in terms of density, acquiring the density data as almost like a learning year. These plate samplers were subject to one, breaking away from their cord when they're hanging in the lake for weeks and months. And also even some of the, some of the nuts and bolts would come loose. 
and we'd lose some plates. So we had an idea of presence or absence of zebra mussels in 2011, but didn't really get uh, data, quantitative data, that we were confident in. So we looked at 2011 as more of a, a year of distribution. And we can see that, in fact, the red diamonds here showing that we have zebra mussels moving from now the east side of the lake, kind of starting to push into the western side a little bit. But by 2012, the sampling plates were, those problems were addressed, and we were starting to get quantitative data. These graphs will be more legible, I think, in the future, but this is our kind of our draft right now. You can't hardly read the little legend, but basically the bigger dots have more zebra mussels compared to the smaller dots for 2012. So we are already starting to get some red uh, areas, which were relatively high densities, but the western side of the lake still had relatively low densities of zebra mussels in 2012. 2013, going from 2012 to 2013, the densities and distribution were increasing. And likewise, from 2013 to 2014, we found uh, also the same pattern. However, if we look at these <coughs> western bays, they still did not produce any, or if they did produce zebra mussels, they were at a very low density. Uh, 2014 and then 2015. Staff did a remarkable job to get 2015 data compiled and were able to present that and we'll be ready to, uh, to go with that in November as well and have it even uh, a little bit more uh, analyzed. One, one well, question, one quick yes. question. Does the scale change? The scale does not change. So, but the, so, the, so the samples in the middle of the lake and on the eastern, southern, it's like the southeastern part of the lake, population density is smaller? Yes. Okay. Yes. Density changes are already occurring in the lake. That's well, that's grass will show it even a little better. That's a uh, good observation and, some, and something that uh, we were kind of tracking. It was, that was one of the questions. How would, it, how would the zebra mussels respond and how would the lake respond? So we go back to these trophic categories. That's kind of what we've been using to, to see if, uh, if we can back out how the lake has changed with these zebra mussels and their different densities. This graph shows existing conditions, which are the squares, and then the conditions in 2015, water quality conditions. In this case, it's clarity. In clarity, wherever you see an arrow going up, that is a, that's an increase in water clarity. And it's happened in many of these sites. However, if you look at those red squares, they have not changed. Water quality or clarity has not significantly changed in those eutrophic bays, but it's changed in most of the other uh, bays in the lake that had that moderate original fertility. The chlorophyll has also changed. And those arrows here indicate when we have a down arrow, that is the, the that's the time period 2015, uh, looking at zebra mussels and comparing the chlorophyll or the algae to the pre-zebra mussel condition. And for many of these bays, many of these sample sites, the chlorophyll or the algae has decreased. However, those eutrophic bays are still somewhat resistant to change. They are still fairly eutrophic. That's red and black indicates uh, still eutrophic conditions based on chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is a marker for, for algae. So the algae is going down. Transparency is increasing. However, the uh, phosphorus has not changed as much. For example, we have a number of bays right in the middle of the lake, or sampling areas, where we have those green squares. That indicates a moderately fertile or mesotrophic condition, but the phosphorus levels have not changed enough to change that to a more, you know, to a less fertile condition. The phosphorus levels are still hanging in there. So typically you would assume that if chlorophyll is going down and transparency is increasing, because the phosphorus a lot of times is associated with chlorophyll or algae, why isn't phosphorus going down? Phosphorus is still hanging in there. And in fact, there's a graph here. Eric put together the group of lakes that have optimal algae for growth, and their densities have started to decrease, actually, in the last, that red line there at the top, in that top um, graph, 
for group one. The zebra mussels seem to maybe have peaked in 2014. They have de they decreased in 2015. However, in group two, which is the area where we would expect moderate growth, the um, zebra mussel density is still increasing. But phosphorus, the blue line, is staying relatively constant or even increasing in some places. The ramifications are of this, when we look at phosphorus and the other trophic indicators, we can, we can pretty much say at this point the lake trophic status has changed. In a lot of places the lake has gotten better. However, if you look at phosphorus as the driver for a lot of our lake processes, which they call kind of energy flow, that doesn't seem to have changed too much. Phosphorus is still present in the water column. Where is the ph why is it still in there? It would appear that bacteria, small bacteria, are holding, you know, they have bacteria, they have phosphorus in them, and that seems to be a uh, area that's increasing. That you'd call that a heterotrophic process. The algae, which generate their own um, um, polysaccharides and sugars, that's autotrophic. So we've changed some of these change. Some of these changes in the lake have gone from an autotrophic system to more of a heterotrophic system, which isn't necessarily bad, but it certainly is a change. So what density, what zebra mussel density causes these changes? Uh, that is not 100% uh, you know, assured yet, but it would appear that what we can say that when zebra mussel densities get high enough to change the trophic conditions, that probably is a, a factor. Well, okay, what, what are those numbers and what kind of numbers do you need for zebra mussels to start changing the lake like that? It looks like based on these plate samplers, which are not perfect, but it's, a, it's an area that we're working with right now, we get 10,000 zebra mussels per meter squared or more, we start seeing these lake changes. When it's less than that, we wouldn't expect as much of a change. And in fact, in these bays on the western side, the red and black squares, their zebra mussel densities were well, well below 10,000 per meter squared, and the change is not occurring. So, what uh, really, what have we learned up to this point? Clarity has increased in Lake Minnetonka. The algae are decreasing in bays with the high zebra mussel densities. That is the right type, when you have the right type of algae. And that, take that a step further, the algae composition really does influence zebra mussel growth. These eutrophic bays with a lot of blue-green algae, they don't seem to be able to support much of a zebra mussel population. And in fact, uh, take that a step, or on, on the other hand, some of these bays that do have the right algae comp composition, zebra mussels have already eaten that to the point where it's now limiting their growth, and their numbers are starting to go down in a few of these bays. And then finally, zebra mussels have the greatest impact, it appears, in these moderately fertile bays with the right type of uh, algae in, uh, in abundance. Well, last slide would be, for future monitoring, uh, we have some short-term monitoring with some uh, interesting results that gives that are really vital to telling us how the lake has changed. The lake is still changing in some of these areas. Long-term monitoring would really help us understand the impact of zebra mussels, not only on Lake Minnetonka, but we can transfer that information to other lakes as well. And this data set that is already in place and could very well uh, increase or certainly uh, be ongoing. This is probably one of the better zebra mussel projects in the whole country at this point, letting us determine how the zebra mussels impact a lake. Yeah. So I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, Thank you, Mr. McCombs. Are there questions, Manager Hickson? So if we have cleaner water, do we, do we see other type of Aquatic growth, like is it is is it notice is there no, is there notice, are there noticeable changes? Yes, yes. There's direct and indirect changes. The direct changes would probably be an increase in aquatic plant growth. With clearer water, you get more sunlight penetration, and you're getting a number of different plant species that will respond to that. <coughs> milfoil might be one of those. Well, I, was gonna, I mean, I was really getting at milfoil. Like, is that has that spiked? That's, we, we have we haven't really analyzed a lot of aquatic plant data. We have some. There's some scattered 
throughout other organizations, and the DNR has some. So that's something that does need to be be done. Um, I don't know if milfoil growth has necessarily increased or not due to this. Um, likely, uh, max depth of plant growth probably has, but uh, that's something we still have to analyze to really have the data on and show that. Manager Blixt. So uh, I'm just f looking at the future and just wondering, uh, is there a likelihood that we will be going into kind of a boom and bust cycle with those bays where they've eaten all the food? And then will there be a likelihood that eventually with the decreased number of zebra mussels, then then we'll get algae again and then they'll come back? Is that, are we Are we going into this kind of I would say yes. That appears to be what is happening. Zebra mussel numbers will go down, algae will come up, zebra mussel population then increase, they'll limit themselves again once the algae goes down and then they'll crash. So it very well could be a cycle like that. But zebra mussels are relatively new in the state. They've only been here since 2000. And this probably, be, these are, so that would appear to be a good possibility in the future. Manager Olson? I was curious about the phosphorus levels. If you <clears throat> if you see a thousand zebra mussels on one big stem of milfoil, at the end of the year the plant collapses. You've got a lot of dead zebra mussels in the bottom of the lake, you got phosphorus going back into the water. So if you were to isolate the whole body of water, sure they're pulling phosphorus out as they consume and then as they die and get it back up again, it's just sitting there. I think, um, uh, although that's just uh, my theory, I can understand why the middle of the lake would stay constant like that. I guess we're really not changing that. <clears throat> that's a good point. The phosphorus doesn't seem to be changing too much in a lot of these areas, but there's a lot of factors involved, including when the zebra mussels died back at the end of the year, a lot of that phosphorus goes into the benthic uh, component as well. But then those animals, those organisms can also release phosphorus back up. The phosphorus levels seem, though, to be not constant, but not changing as much as the chlorophyll and also, and then in turn, the, the clarity, which is changing, which is a new finding, really, for these lakes with zebra mussels. Other questions? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm interested in Jim's reaction, being a scientist. Uh, I, I thought there was good news and bad news in this presentation, uh, but you know, from a science point of view, how, how would you react to the findings? Is it uh, something you'd expect, or? Um, I guess I would say yes, um, and I'm not that surprised by the phosphorus numbers either, to be honest. Um, but I think that the term of the time that we've had a chance to look at it, we don't have enough information to know really what's going to happen long term. Andrew Shackleton. So how, do, how does this relate to what we found in Christmas Lake? Given yeah, the nice thing we can start to do, I mean the fortunate thing with Minnetonka is we have really varying water quality throughout the lake. So we have an idea, like Jim said, we don't, really don't have enough long term data to say yes, this is the absolute trend. Um, but we can start to see that um, these divisions by the amount of algae and chlorophyll in the lakes kind of do limit or, or promote zero muscle growth. So Christmas Lake has very low chlorophyll levels. Uh, it would be actually be on that low end of that uh, map that Steve showed. Um, so it, it's fair to, to predict or at least to, to, to theorize that the population in Christmas Lake would be low. Um, now whether and, and probably the water quality changes would be very minimal. Um, but some questions we have is, you know, even at a low density growth, uh, is that still high enough to, you know, have an effect on the native mussel uh, community in the lake? Uh, so we could see a change, you know, in that way rather than maybe, you know, clarity that we saw in some of these bays. So that's how we can start to kind of apply this to the other lakes and almost predict um, somewhat what the impacts may be on a given water body. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.
next item on the agenda is the um, I, permit 15-445 of Moody Lake Preserve. As Mr. Dietrich gets settled in there, just a few m comments about the process this evening. Um, there will first be the staff presentation, engineer presentation. Um, then the managers will ask questions, and either the staff or the engineer or the applicant might be answering those questions. At that point, we'll open the floor. I'll have a few ground rules about comments from members of the public. And then um, when we close the floor, the managers can begin their discussion again. Um, so at this point, Mr. Dietrich. Thank you, President White. President White, managers, before the board this evening for approval is per permit number 15445 for Mooney Lake Preserve, an 11 lot subdivision located at 306 Avenue North in the city of Orno. Uh, this matter is appearing before the board this evening due to a public request that had not been rescinded prior to the meeting. Uh, staff has also received a number of comments in email. Uh, this evening I'll briefly be going over the project location, uh, the details for the existing and proposed uh, conditions of the project, uh, the rules triggered and how they were met, and finally a staff recommendation. Uh, the Moody Lake Preserve project is taking place on the Dayton parcel, which is approximately 90 acres in size uh, on the southwest side of Mooney Lake uh, in the city of Orno. And this, this map will just show you kind of your um, relative location in the watershed district. And just to further um, orient you, uh, this is a map of the watershed of Mooney Lake. Uh, it's located in the Greater Long Lake sub-watershed. Uh, and if you'll notice on the south side, uh, the parcel is partially within the Moon Lake watershed and par partially uh, draining to Hadley Lake as well. Uh, under in existing conditions, uh, there's a single family home lot, a tennis court, and an outbuilding uh, located on the parcel for a total of 1.38 acres of impervious surface, all of which are untreated at this point. Uh, and this is including the road and the uh, associated driveways. Um, these structures and parts of the road are planned to be removed through the construction process. Uh, just to further orient you uh, in terms of municipal boundaries, uh, Mooney Lake is divided uh, by three different cities. So to the northwest we have the city of Medina, uh, to the southwest we have the city of Orno, which the project parcel is located, and to the east we have the city of Plymouth. Uh, and now just to give you an idea of the composition of the proposed site, um, as you can see, uh, there, this is actually divided into two separate plans just uh, because of the size of the parcel. Um, so there's three lots on the west side uh, along Hunter Drive. Uh, there's four lots on the uh, lakeshore and then one just west of the lakeshore. Uh, and the one a couple things that I want to draw your attention to is the outlot A. Um, boundaries are kind of drawn here to the north and then along the three lots to the west. Uh, and then another point, um, just to kind of further orient you, uh, west uh, this is designated the west road. So this is kind of where the plan um, will show different aspects. So that's just going to be important a little bit further down the road. Uh, and on the south plan, uh, as this fits into the, the last slide, uh, so this is on the south side of the project. At the road to the far east, that's, that's going to be designated the east road, and then I'll also draw your attention to uh, outlot C, which is going to be uh, important for this next slide here. So through this project, uh, these two outlots uh, will be are, they are currently in conservation. Uh, what's being proposed right now is a 45 acre prairie restoration, which will seek to remove all of the, the invasive species and restore the natural prairie vegetation. Uh, under the city of Orno zoning uh, ordinances, this area is um, zoned for two acre lots, which translates into 30 to 35 lots could be fit into this parcel. However, under the current uh, composition, it's under, uh, it's proposed 11 lots along with the 45 acre Prairie restoration. So I'll briefly be going through uh, the rules that have been triggered by this project. So that would be erosion control, wetland protection, and stormwater management. And in the next few minutes, I'll explain um, basically all of the criteria of the rules. So first, uh, the district's erosion control rule is triggered for any project that exceeds 5,000 square feet of disturbance or 50 cubic yards of excavation or fill. Uh, since the, this project exceeds those thresholds, the rule is triggered, and accordingly, the applicant is provided um, 
several construction BMPs in accordance with the district's rule. Uh, as you can see here, the light blue um, is uh, outlining the sill fence locations. Uh, so this is down the region of all land disturbing activity. The yellow circles um, are inlet protection, and there's construction entrances on the east road here, and there's just going to be another one up here to the north. Uh, and then also included within their uh, stormwater uh, pollution prevention plan, uh, they've mentioned concrete washout and final stabilization. Uh, the concrete washout will be field fit, uh, but will be complete with an impermeable liner. Uh, and the final stabilization is going to be uh, accomplished through uh, introducing seed and sod on site. Additionally, tree protection is uh, mainly achieved through the installation of silk prints. Um, however, they will be having uh, several conservation easements over individual single-family home lots where trees and other vegetation will be protected. So moving on to wetland protection, um, the district's wetland protection rule is triggered any time that the stormwater rule is also triggered. Uh, and accordingly, uh, for all wetlands that are located on site, the applicant needs to provide uh, the appropriate buffer width based on the management class of the wetland. And that's derived from the district's functional assessment of wetlands. So uh, as you can see here, the red outlines show the location of all the buffer area that's provided on the north side of the, um, north side of the project. Uh, and it should be noted too that there is no uh, impacts for wetlands and there is no, um, no proposal for buffer averaging. So all buffer woods have been provided in full based on the management classes of the wetlands. Uh, and this shows the southern section uh, of the plans and also outlines the, um, the appropriate buffer widths. So in this way, the applicant has met the, uh, the criteria of the wetland protection rule. Uh, moving on to stormwater management. Um, the rule is triggered as uh, the proposed project is introducing 3.72 acres of new or additional impervious surface. Uh, and accordingly, um, the applicant is re required to treat phosphorus rate and volume on site and has done so through uh, a number of different BMPs. In total, there's nine lot specific rain gardens, two infiltration basins, and one filtration bench. Uh, the red squares here uh, are outlining the rain gardens on the north side. So these are all lot specific rain gardens. Uh, and I just want to mention that on lot two, block two, uh, as a stipulation of the permits, uh, the applicant will have to verify that there's two vertical feet of separation between the low openings of the home and the wetland that is adjacent uh, right here. Uh, it appears that this is being met from the plans. However, um, it's something that needs to be verified at the time when the final uh, house plan is uh, settled on. Uh, and this shows the final three rain gardens for a total of nine, and this is the, the south portion of the project. Uh, so additionally, um, just to orient you a little bit more here, this is the west road that we had talked about uh, a little bit earlier. Um, so the uh, north direction is uh, to the right in this, this image. So there's two infiltration basins that are outlined by the blue squares here on the east and west side of the road. Uh, and there's a large NERF pond here, uh, which is new, ur new urban runoff program. Um, so this pond is primarily used for rate control. Uh, so And then moving to the eastern portion of the subdivision, uh, there is a filtration basin uh, denoted here by the red square um, that will also be treating uh, portions of this road and other parts of the cow pot. Uh, and in total, the applicant required to provide 18,000 cubic feet of extraction uh, has, and in doing the uh, other BMPs that have been mentioned, they'll accomplish about 20,000 cubic feet of extraction. Uh, this is not counting the 45 acres of stored prairie uh, into that equation. So in summary, uh, the, this project triggers the district's erosion control, wetland protection, and stormwater management rules. Um, and the proposed project has met all of the, all of the district's rule, applicable rules. And staff is therefore <coughs> recommending approval of the project with the conditions and stipulations that are mentioned in the permit report. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. Uh, Mr. Meehan? <coughs> Chair Weight Managers. And, and for those who might not know, Chris Meehan is district engineer. With Lank Associates. 
Chair White, managers, uh, included in your packet today was a memorandum that summarizes the district to receive responses uh, from EOR on the project. And so what I want to do is at least take the chance. You've got it on short notice, but uh, allow the chance to see if there are any questions. But it was essentially responding to questions that we received in association with the permit. Do managers have questions on the link memo? It's pretty straightforward. Um, all right then. At this point, we'll open um, the floor for comments. And um, remember that this is not a hearing. It is not litigation. Um, it is an opportunity to allow public input. Um, we will. Um, I'm not going to put time limits on presentations, but do ask that everyone be brief in their comments. Um, keep your comments relevant to the question at hand, which is permits, and um, maybe avoid repetition. Um, the first person who may speak, if interested, is the applicant. Madam Chair and uh, members of the board. Will you state your name and address? I'm sorry. Uh, Jeffrey Watson. I'm an attorney with Moss and Barnett in Minneapolis. <coughs> I represent the applicant. We're happy to respond to any questions you may have, but I think the staff report says everything. So, unless you have questions now, we're still here if you have questions after hearing other comments. Thank you. Do any managers have questions at this point? Thank you, Mr. Watson. Is there someone else who wishes to speak? If you'll give us your name and address. Madam Chair, members of the board, my name is James S. Lane. I am of counsel to the Minneapolis law firm of Robert R. Hopper & Associates, which represents 12 or more residents of Medina, Orono, and Plymouth who have an interest in the subject of the application that's before you this evening for permitting. <clears throat> One of our clients is Ann Healy, who petitioned the board and asked for this presentation opportunity this evening. So at the outset, I want to thank you for granting her request. And uh, Ms. Healy, would you stand so that the board would recognize you? Thanks again for uh, allowing her to uh, have her <coughs> views uh, received this evening. Ms. Healy and our clients have engaged the services of two consulting firms that are going to speak to you briefly. The first is Emmons and Olivier, whose founder principal, Cecilio Olivier, is well known to most of you. And the other is Applied Ecological Services, whose representative, Doug Mensing, is going to speak to you this evening. And we understand the time constraints, and we are mindful of your rules of the road in that respect. Uh, Mr. Olivier and Mr. Mensing are going to present compelling evidence that the board should defer action this evening on these permit applications and then direct staff to further collaborate with them, our consultants, in redesigning and improving the stormwater controls and management features to improve this project, minimize runoff risks that we think are still present and avoid further impairment of Mooney Lake. We appreciate that the district permits hundreds of projects every year and its own consultants, engineers, and technical staff are well versed in applying district rules in sometimes sensitive projects like this one. But we submit that all projects are not alike, same size, does not fit all, we urge you to listen carefully to what Mr. Olivier and Mr. Mensing have to say, and then be prepared to exercise judgments independent of staff's recommendations for approval. We strongly believe that you can do better with this project. And with our help and with that of our consultants, we implore you to work with us to make this project better than it is already designed to be. This is a very special project. It's a very special property with valuable natural resources. It fits squarely within the 
four corners of the Minnesota Environmental Rights Act, which is the statutory basis for the legal claims that are being asserted by our clients. And more importantly, for purposes here this evening, it fits squarely within the leadership responsibilities that this board is charged with in its own vision statement and its own regulatory mission statements for protecting and improving and managing surface waters within the district and the relationships that they have to the ecosystems of which they are a part and prevention of irreversible damage to the area's natural resources. So thank you for your indulgence. I now wish to uh, introduce to you uh, Mr. Cecilio Olivier. We have, you're presenting something in slide form? Uh, correct, I have an introduction and then uh, I'll be presenting. Some and can slides. you make those informa that information available to us? Yes. Thank you. I'll distribute it right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Madam President, managers, um, if I may, I would like to start this presentation with a couple of points that I feel I need to make at this point. Uh, first, uh, my assessment presented last week uh, should not be interpreted as a criticism of Minnehaha Creek uh, review staff, who I know do an excellent job reviewing and implementing the Minnehaha Creek rules. Also, uh, my report uh, shouldn't be interpreted as a criticism of the district rules, which I believe do a good job protecting resources in general. This report reflects uh, my serious concerns uh, about the stormwater impact on this unique and high quality uh, big woods area uh, with the development as proposed. Uh, also, I would like to um, mention that as an important point that uh, my report is based on the initial information received uh, Wednesday last week, uh, but at no one's fault, uh, there was additional more information uh, that uh, was sent and we were not uh, able to, to get until my report had been already submitted. And this is important because some of the concerns the report that I had were addressed by uh, this new information. So with that, um, I'll start the presentation. We can let's go to the next one. Okay. Uh, as I mentioned, there were uh, new information that we received. Um, the main differences with respect to the information we had before were mo mo mainly two. There were some good upgrades in the size, shape, and location of the rain gardens. Uh, there was a note um, at the uh, uh, front of the uh, uh, proposal plans uh, that reads uh, houses, impervious surfaces, and individual driveways uh, need to direct all runoff to the proposed rain gardens curves uh, will be required uh, on all driveways to accomplish this. So that was, that was something that we welcomed because uh, that information was not uh, available to us and one of our concerns was the ability to be able to capture the, the runoff. I will mention a little bit more about that and the problems that I see uh, doing it, but that will come later. So the issues addressed, uh, basically they managed two wetlands. Um, we look at the information, it still was not modeled. Uh, we couldn't see the evidence, but the one foot bounce and 200 parts per billion input, um, we verified that by our own, own analysis, so that's not an issue for me anymore. 
There were some inconsistencies in driveway areas and widths that, uh, through review, had been already addressed. That was part of my uh, original report. And uh, median runoff discharge rates. Now, I feel that, as designed right now, the runoff discharge rates are met. Um, there is a still a number of things of great concern um, to me. And, you know, I will start with a big picture of things without actually getting too much into the numbers, because uh, we probably will be tired of those. But um, I'm, really, I'm really concentrating on the wood area. I mean, the rest of the uh, uh, development, from my perspective, is very well done and protected. But the wood area is the one that I'm concerned about. So uh, big perspective, we have about 19 acres of woods. Uh, there will be about 9% impervious as proposed, including the, uh, the, the uh, existing impervious. There's an issue of potentially uh, adding outbuildings. Out there is uh, not a specific, uh, as far as we could tell, uh, uh, regulations that will prevent that from happening. So that could happen at different uh, scales depending on the uh, area, depending on the uh, parcel. And then, obviously, there will be some um, additional, potentially additional loans and others that uh, could bring everything from, you know, to a, to a total of about 13%. From my perspective, just looking at it from the outside, and with my experience, it's a significant land cover change, you know, to start with that. Um, and to a certain extent, you know, in my mind, it becomes to more like a low-density residential development but with the only difference that is put in the woods, that you know, pristine area woods. Um, so it's still a great concern, and this is a uh, Minneha Creek related uh, issue. Um, I understand that the woods and everything else is probably something that you could not do much about, but uh, you know, the, the difficulty of impervious routing to rain gardens, um, I, I really sympathize with the note. I thought it was a good improvement. But there are no design details on how routing will be done for each rain garden. Um, and also not uh, information regarding how potential outbuildings or lawns uh, could be taken into consideration in the future uh, adding uh, impervious surfaces. And the reason why I think it's going to be challenged um, quite challenging, although potentially could be done. And if you look at this uh, example in here, uh, and you look at different watersheds, sub-watersheds uh, in uh, yellow, and you look at this rain garden that is supposed to uh, cover this impervious area, um, in theory, you say, well, you know, it makes sense. In reality, you're going to have a widening uh, uh, driveway with areas that will be lower and up higher. Um, you're going to have to somewhat direct that flow into it. You're going to have to have some way in which you can collect through the gathers of your house everything in one location to be able to bring into the rain garden. And I mean, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to I mean, sometimes you will have to go um, a little bit of uphill. Sometimes there will be areas in which you get the water stagnant. <coughs> so um, it is complicated. It doesn't mean that it cannot be done, but it's, it's a concern that there are not specific plans um, to be able to do that. And here's another example, um, probably more uh, simple, in the sense that uh, you have your house in here, you have the driveway here, you have the rain garden that is going to be taking care of all this runoff. Again, you will have to do the gutters, put the gutters into the uh, driveway, or find a way to bring the water into the rain garden in a different way. So what will be running water here, it's fairly steep as well. Um, you're going to have your opening here, you have, you're going to have to have gutters, excuse me, um, uh, curves in the, in the areas, you know, uh, the nodes mentioned. And you're going to have to somewhat push this in a very steep slope, have the leaning towards the rain garden, and there's going to be an area here that you're not going to be able to treat, and the possibility of this running out. So it is a complicated design, and it's very detailed design what you need to do in terms of being able to uh, capture that. Again, it could be done, um, but we haven't seen exactly how. Um, so, a still of uh, great concern uh, it would be the rain garden placement and design. Um, there are a number of rain gardens um, that are uh, uh, located in a number of different areas, but are not, there are not a specific borings that we could find. 
uh, you know, for each one of those uh, rain, uh, gardens. Um, you know, your rule, which I think is smart, uh, suggests that you have to have that uh, for each uh, infiltration or rain garden facility. Um, maybe the rule refers to bigger facilities, but in this particular case, I think it would be important to have those borings. There are other borings that were done in other areas. I mean, that, that was done uh, and shows, you know, kind of similar materials. Uh, but I think it would be just important to um, to have to know exactly what what the composition of the soils would be in the area where the rain gardens are proposed because I mean morphology or, or soils in Minnesota change so much that uh, you could get into a clay area and run into some problems. Um, there are no the same details on rate control weirs of the rain gardens. Um, as I said before, the uh, peak control from my perspective is solved. In, in the area of the woods, but uh, there is an issue uh, in terms of not having uh, an idea or design or a specific uh, example or, or a detail on how those weirs are going to be constructed. There is, uh, there is detail in the modeling, the modeling includes those, but there is no specific detail in terms of you know, how this half foot weir will be, will be incorporated, will be um, uh, designed. There are a lot of very good um, details in, the, in, in terms of outlet structures and in terms of inlet structures, cross sections, uh, wetland um, you know, composition um, uh, regarding filtration devices and all that. But this particular case, which concerns me um, regarding the woods, because that's what I'm concerned about, um, it's, it's, it's problematic. And because of that also, um, there is erosion that will be uh, due to concentrated flows. I mean, if you can imagine, there's a rain garden that's going to be collecting the water. It is going to be going through a weir that restricts the flow to pre-development conditions. There's going to be a concentrated flow into an area that is highly erodible. I mean, you see the picture in here. It's, it's a lot of uh, organic material, not a lot of vegetation on it. You put, you know, concentrated flow in that uh, area, and it's going to be it's going to be a problem. So. Um, it would be a good idea to uh, add some details and to incorporate some kind of dispersion feature. Um, and this is something that uh, you know, we, haven't, we haven't seen and, and it would be good incorporation, a good change in the, in the plans. Um, so, and this is a statement that probably is going to be some disagreement with, uh, but I believe that uh, the runoff retention proposed uh, is not enough to actually mimic the system hydrology. And the hydrology is a very specific hydrology, it's a uh, pristine hydrology, it's a natural hydrology, and uh, the rule as proposed right now, or the improvements as proposed right now with the one inch and potentially two inches of, of retention um, is not enough. And I have done a number of studies recently that prove that. So, um, so, in you know, more runoff volume, which I think is going to happen, and again, I'm talking about just the, the, the wood area. I think there are going to be other areas in which that could be true. I mean, there would be reduction in phosphorus because, I mean, we're putting some facilities in areas that were not before, and there's going to be some reduction in volume because of that reason. But the woods itself um, is going to be a problem. I think it's going to be more runoff uh, coming out of it in terms of volume, and because the runoff is going to have a higher concentration uh, of pollutants, which will happen just because of development, there will be overall uh, higher loads on an annual basis coming from there um, into the woods itself and then potentially outside the woods. Um, important concern, but yes, you know, not as uh, high uh, in my list, uh, would be the additional runoff volume uh, to a landlock area or lake like uh, Mooney Lake. Um, this is not going to be a big impact, uh, especially now that there are some specific, uh, you know, designs to be able to capture uh, the impervious uh, portion of uh, most of the driveways. Um, still, it's a landlocked basin. Um, you know, big storm events could, you know, uh, introduce a, a insignificant amount of volume. But when you look at the overall size of Mooney Lake, I mean, that's not going to make a huge difference. I mean, a quarter of an inch mass maximum for a big storm event. So. Um, it's going to probably increase the, the amount of time that pumping needs to happen uh, when, when uh, the lake is, uh, is pumped, but not a big deal. 
Um, and then, you know, not accounting for runoff volume uh, increase due to climate change. Uh, that's something that uh, we typically do. We'll try to design for that. Uh, I didn't see any evidence that that was a consideration. On the other hand, I mean, there are so many other things that we need to do first that that's probably not an uh, important concern in my list. So, what do you, what do, you do with this? Um, uh, my, my approach to problems, uh, regardless of litigation, um, has been always, you know, what can we do? How can we solve the problem? How can we improve it? So there are many approaches to this. Um, obviously, the first approach is not building in the, in the big woods, which is unrealistic from my perspective, I will see. It's an approach that could be done, uh, and that eliminates all impact um, and provides with an area that's probably going to be good to, uh, for people to use around. Just build the houses some other place except for in the big woods. I mean, the three houses that are proposed in there. Uh, it is possible to reduce the number of lots going from three to two, maybe one, and that will significantly reduce the impact. Too. There are specific improvements in, on the, in, in the design, uh, which I think are good. Um, uh, it would be probably a good idea to look at the possibility of introducing uh, permeable surfaces, uh, surfaces like asphalt pavers, uh, permeable concrete. Uh, that could be tricky depending on the place that you put them and, and you know, the uh, the area and the trees and the leaves. That, um, incorporate flow dispersion uh, designs, that's, as I mentioned before, is very, very important. And uh, there could be other BMPs in addition to rain gardens that could be incorporated. Uh, there are specific, you know, um, kind of kind of French drains with uh, gravel around that you can put in a very non, uh, you know, non-visible way that could do the trick too. And the last one, which uh, is always a uh, concern of mine when it comes to these projects, um, stronger covenant uh, controls it would be nice to be able to, to if you know, the development happens and, and happens in this way, and potentially with some improvements, hopefully, um, that there are controls in there that will address new impervious areas and land use changes. Um, and with that, that's everything I have. Thank you very much. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Dr. Bensing of uh, Applied Ecological Services will allow me to give a report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm able to throw this in here. <clears throat> Madam President, members of the board, thank you very much. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to have some time to speak about some of my findings and concerns about the project. I'll keep this very brief. Um, uh, for context, I just wanted to say over the past 10 plus years, uh, I've worked closely with the Minion Creek Watershed District on a number of great projects. Natural resource projects, conservation projects, projects not unlike this in some regards. Um, and uh, it's been clear through that work that I've done with the district that uh, there's a strong ethic and a recognition on the part of the district in terms of the value that uplands play in your water resources and the mission of the district. So with that context, um, the focus of my talk is on the site's Big Woods remnant. I know the district has limited permitting authority with regard to upland resources, but as we've talked a little bit about here today, and hopefully how I'll illustrate, there are relationships between that and the stormwater runoff and the permitting requirements of the district. So I'm not sure if any of you have been out to the site. Um, it's a very impressive big woods remnant. Um, it's been well documented. We've known about this for a long time. 
um, before this project was presented. Um, it's a rare maple basswood forest uh, that's good quality. That's a rare, rare to have a good quality maple basswood forest like this in the region. Uh, some of the mature trees on the site are over 150 years old. Um, and this provides habitat for rare plants and animals. Those surveys have not been conducted, but um, that's where you find the rare plants and animals are in these high quality remnants that still remain. Um, as I believe you know, the, uh, the site itself has about uh, this 16.5 uh, acres roughly of big woods remnant on the site, um, but that's contiguous with uh, an additional block of um, big woods forest to the north. And in total, it's close to 40 acres. That's a significant block of contiguous forest. It's not pristine to the north there. There are some homes. Um, but that just puts things into context in terms of the significance of this stand of maple basswood forest. Now, from a conservation design standpoint, the first step taken is to look at primary and secondary conservation areas. Um, this graphic here shows those as being some of these forests and streams and such. And that's the first step, to identify those primary areas. Then to identify those areas that are not within the conservation areas and try to focus development as best you can in those areas, not to do dispersed development throughout the site. Now, the proposed development doesn't do what's, what's got the red line through it totally, but my point is the primary conservation area at the site should be the big woods remnant. Um, prairies are valuable, they provide many functions, um, the easements are, uh, are an important component of the project as it's proposed now, um, but a prairie is something you can construct in about five years, and, you know, this forest has been around for centuries, millennia maybe. Mr. Mansing, you'll be talking about water quality? I'm moving on to the, some stormwater issues, yes. The forest loss and fragmentation shown here, this is the site plan that outlines in green <coughs> the, uh, the tree survey that was done for the project and fragmentation will be taking place through the form of the, the tree clearing and um, from the dashed red line over to the right. So there will be fragmentation taking place in about two-thirds or so of the big woods remnant. In those areas, again, as um, Cecilia Olivier referred to, the uh, roads, driveways, buildings, outbuildings, lawns, etc., will be resulting in land use change and will be resulting in runoff changes and increases. Some photographs, the construction fencing out on the site showing some of the areas that are slated for clearing for the septic systems and septic fields. I won't go into detail on the edge effects, but by transecting through the forest with the fragmentation and such, um, not only is the areas where the trees are cleared affected, um, but the areas adjacent to those are affected in a variety of ways. So moving on to the stormwater runoff, uh, the existing Big Woods Forest has a drainage swale up in the northeastern portion. And so you can see the existing swale through here, the drainage way, flows like this down here to Mooney Lake. Um, again, thinking about what that currently is with the dense tree cover and the canopy of the maples and the oaks, um, with the duff on the ground and healthy soils, that absorbs a lot, of the, a lot of the rainwater that falls and you don't have a tremendous amount of runoff. This is that swale looking down slope towards Mooney Lake. You can see how the ground slopes on both sides and the water currently flows down there through that drainage way into the lake. Um, down at the lower end of that, and this is hard to see with all the leaves in the ground, but there is a, uh, there's a, a little bit of erosion already starting to take place here. This system is kind of on the edge, I would say. Um, more, more runoff to this system uh, is going to cause additional runoff, uh, or excuse me, additional erosion um, into the impaired Mooney Lake. Um, of course, there's a rain garden that is proposed in this general vicinity, but when that is overtopped, which it will be overtopped during significant rain events, um, that will result in the untreated water going into the lake. So thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer questions. Or Thank you. Um, are there others who wish to speak on this permit issue? I see no hands. Um, 
at this time. I just simply want to thank you for the time to speak to you this evening and again urge the board to defer issuance of permits while we try to further improve this project that's before you for permitting this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Um, do you, Mr. Easter, or Mr. Meehan, wish to comment at this time before the managers have questions? Yeah, manager, President White, managers, uh, in response to the information you heard, uh, they are all points we take into consideration when we do the permits and why the district has rules uh, to help ensure the resources are protected as far as volume and as far as loading. Um, this project has gone and above and beyond meeting our rules and um, our requirements for all of these factors. Um, so in, in looking at this, uh, just take that into consideration as far as how they've done their work so far. They've done an exemplary job as far as the lots they've established, how they've put together the conservation easement. Um, and as you can see in the permit report, they've done a good job addressing the volume controls that are mentioned. While there are land use changes, that's why the district has the rules it has, is to address these volume controls and land use changes, um, and also address the water quality concerns that come along with it. The other part that came up uh, that was mentioned is as far as when the single family homes come through, the district will also be reviewing those permits that come through. Your uh, excellent staff will evaluate those to ensure that the erosion control and all the stormwater quality improvements get implemented at that time as well. That's all that. Managers, do you have questions? Manager Blixt? I just have a question about what, what you just said, Chris. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, every time an uh, individual homeowner is going to be uh, putting in their plans for their site, um, you will be reviewing that at that time. And so yep. I just want to be clear that uh, because uh, Cecilio um, talked about things that were not in place right now in terms of the plans and so um, things like the would, would that include when you review that the um, weirs on the rain gardens or so that will yeah. that will come at a later date and you'll manager review that yeah. then yeah manager blix yeah that's where we would review the applicant has provided some typical details that are associated with the minnesota stormwater manual sure. so we would ensure that they come into compliance uh, with those designs and typical designs we'd see with rain gardens and then would that be the same for the soil borings that he asked about absolutely okay and the um what about um the runoff retention the runoff retention. So as part of that, we'd evaluate the, that the rain gardens are properly sized to handle what they need to have. There will be absolutely, there will be overtopping. The rain gardens won't be meant to handle all the volume that comes to them, they, nor are they designed to do that. We'll ensure that whatever volume does overtop, it is properly handled and there's no erosion issues that go on downstream. And one other thing he asked about was the, the, the ability of the driveways to be properly sloped in order mm -hmm. to reach the rain gardens. Yes, so that be taking a look at that yeah. when it comes in for the yep. design as well. Yep, each one of these homes will be custom homes and so their footprints are preliminary in concept and so it'll be ensuring that that ability we've initially evaluated can handle those additional drainage features being added to the site and we would just confirm that they do that and it will be a matter of it'll be grading it'll be the driveways managing those and the gutters on the houses as well ensuring those are properly routed to get them to the appropriate treatment area and uh, for any individual home that uh, people in the area might be concerned about um, would we be sending out a notice with regards to that at the time that we do the permitting or or will that not incur the typical postcard that goes out to neighbors I, I, and I'll defer to Tom with this one I don't believe those those trigger the proper that public notice process the district has in place manager Blake's uh, generally single-family homes do not trigger public notice unless there's wetlands on site however if it's a part of a subdivision that public notice requirement is considered to be met when the subdivision comes in right and I understand that and I'm, I'm just because I, obviously there's a big public interest in this particular project I'm just asking would there be a way for people in the area if they were really wanted to know about individual lots as they were developed could ask to be on a notification list or something <coughs> and you could send them out the email to 
Manager Blake get noticed we when that, it happened? We do that on a case-by-case -case basis. Sure. If there is interest in the area, um, and if it does turn out to be the case here, uh, then we can absolutely do that. Okay. I just wanted to know if that was an option for people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have Mr. Welch. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair and Managers. I absolutely will turn it back to staff, but Manager Blix was asking for some clarification on a couple of items, and I wanted to make sure that there was a clarification as well for in the manager's mind. Maybe this was the question you were about to ask, and I apologize if I'm jumping the gun, but the all the documents that the district has with regard to this permit were uploaded and provided to the uh, request, it was the request came from Mr. Lane last week, and I don't know what the the issue is about <coughs> what documents there were, but we uploaded, the district uploaded everything it had and made it available, so. Thank you. My question was different. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the City of Orono granted final plat approval, and one of their conditions was that rain gardens, as I understand it, rain gardens be built before before the lots are developed, am I correct, Mr. Watson? Yes, um, the uh, final plat resolution, final plat approval resolution, mm -hmm. allows the developer to locate rain gardens on the lots as and when building permits are uh, applied for. Okay. The location on a lot and the size of the rain garden needed will depend on where the house is going to be located and how much of a footprint and impervious surface it's, it's causing. So staff at the city level uh, put it to council, do you want us to impose easements now for rain gardens? And in that case, of course, we have to go back to the city if we want to move them, get them vacated <coughs> where they were originally. It didn't make a lot of sense, and council did agree with that. So the rain gardens will be dedicated in conjunction with individual uh, lot improvements. Thank you. And that's your understanding. Mm -hmm. Are there other questions, Manager Calkins? I have a couple. Um, Two things, two things related to, to soil. Um, one is, is what is the soil type, and have per tests been done to determine infiltration under current conditions? Uh, and there have been soil borings done on what there are infiltration and filtration practices, and based on the soil characterization that they've used to, to classify the soil borings that they have in there, they followed the Minnesota stormwater manuals guidance for that. There have not been specific percolation tests done associated with this, but using the guidance documents on the soil classifications that were done, that's how the basis of the infiltration rates were calculated. But infiltration rate will be influenced by the vegetation that's present and how long it's been there. So is that accounted for in any way? Uh, the vegetation that's there, no. It's assuming it's essentially a blanket new new soil that they're having to deal with at that point in time. So what they're doing is taking a conservative approach that it's not accounting for this existing vegetation that's already been there that would help accentuate infiltration rates that come along with it. Say that again. <laughs> <laughs> so it, the, the vegetation that's already out there that's that's helping infiltration rates or would be considered overestimating infiltration rates is not accounted for in the rates that were used to identify the infiltration. The soil type that was there was using a standard value that's classified, that's been tested for those types of soils. And that I understand, but the point was made, and it is a true, is a true point, is that uh, it, it depends on soil type, um, but the soil being the same, infiltration rates in a forested area is going to be quite different and much higher yep. than it will be in a, re in a finished residential landscape. Sure, absolutely. Especially for turf grass. Yes, absolutely. Um, and, I, and I understand that the whole woods isn't being cut down. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how big that impact is, but is that accounted for in any way? 
that's accounted for in how they've calculated their volumes and their runoff coefficients. And so that change in land use is absolutely accounted for in the information that we've received. Okay. Um, is that, does it also include the change in uh, runoff that would uh, potentially occur because of the loss of tree canopy? Yep, absolutely. And, and what kind of a value is put on that? The, the value that was increased associated with that is the, they have the runoff coefficient. So there was a 10% increase, I believe, in the runoff coefficient associated with taking just a pure lawn area versus a big woods area associated with that. Outside of the impervious house and driveway, that was all accounted for as strictly all impervious. Okay. Um, there is likely to be I've never seen a project where it has not happened um, that you are going to lose additional trees over time because of construction. Yep. Is there any kind of a factor in there that assumes a certain loss? The, the assumption is that they have a wider footprint that has no trees installed in it at all. So the trade-off in the sense where the land use is considered, the trade-off is assuming you have a very conservative area where there aren't any trees at all knowing that there will be trees replanted over time associated with that area. So to your point, are there is there an assumption that additional trees will be lost? Um, it's accounted for in the overall curve number or at runoff coefficient that they have for the area that essentially it would be a barren area outside of what they've got. In the, in the sense of there's no tr additional trees in that area. Okay, thanks. May I answer some other questions? Then I'm looking for a motion in two parts. One would be to approve permit 15-445 um, with the conditions and stipulations as stated. And then the second part would be to direct our staff to prepare findings of fact and conclusion be brought back to us at the next meeting for our approval. Manager Miller. You know, I, I'm going to vote for this because it meets all of our rules. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel bad about losing the, the woods, but mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to put it in perspective of I got a. I live in Edina, and I got a 50,000 square foot lot. My neighbor's got an 8,000 square foot lot. She doubled the size of her driveway and has French, uh, the French uh, drain into my yard. Uh, and uh, you know, I can you know, it's like every time it rains, I see the, the benefits of of having uh, uh, advocates for. Uh, uh, preventing damage from uh, from runoff from overbuilding, but uh, we can only follow our rules. And there's, uh, you know, if, if we uh, uh, violate uh, the standards that we set in the rules, we're just setting ourselves up for for, li for litigation, in which we'll lose because we we uh, haven't got any basis from what did from for denying it. So, for that reason, I'm going to vote for it, and I'll make the motion. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Manager Blix? I will just say that, you know, in all my years on the board, I, you know, we've, and we've all, you know, it used to be that the board uh, approved all the permits. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, none of you had to endure that. Um, <laughs> I, I At least three of you did. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you were here. You remember, you remember that. Um, and just, I'll just say, over the course of the many years that we did that, I, you know, I learned a tremendous amount about, you know, the permit process and and what we, you know, can and cannot do. And I also learned, um, you know, how attached uh, neighboring property owners can become to land that's not developed and. Um, and land that's not theirs. And land that's not theirs. And and I, you know, time and time again, I've seen this happen, and it's really it's really painful for everybody, and it's painful for us just like it is for you. Trust me. But the fact of the matter is, we have to, as Dick said, it, it's we have to do what's in our rules and what's right. And um, and you know, and it's and it is hard to do, but you know, that's just the reality. And and the property owner at this point has has met our rules, and hopefully, um, in the long run, there will not be a degradation to the Mooney Lake in the long run, or or um, to any other uh, resources. Although you know, 
Now we don't regulate woods, as we know, but so I, I will just say every time though, when neighbors do get involved, just to say for all of you that are here, that it always helps our process. It's always really important. It's always beneficial and makes for a better project in the long run. And so, um, I, so I think I just wanted to throw that in because people are here and it's really important. And I'm sorry that more of you didn't come and speak, but oh well. <laughs> um, we gave you the opportunity to come and hear the process and I think that was, that's always a good thing. So, Thank you, good comments. Anything else before we vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Mr. Deasy. Mr. Deasy. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everyone, for being tonight. Item 11.2, Mr. Heyman, Resolution 15-088. We can wait a few moments. Sure. <clears throat> if only you had an interesting su subject. Was that a tough act to follow? I hope not. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little already, disappointed people didn't stick already. around. Yeah, that's a don't, don't, take it, don't take it personally. It's all, all golf for you. <laughs> uh, good evening, Madam Chair, Managers. Uh, I'm in front of you this evening with Resolution 15088, which is for final approval this evening. It's, um, it's the ordering of Meadowbrook Golf Course Ecological Restoration Project and the authorization to amend the cooperative agreement with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Throughout the past two years, uh, the Board of Managers has consistently directed staff to work with the Park Board um, to explore the partnership with MPRB on, on the Meadowbrook Golf Course related to, to watershed processes, ecological integrity, and connections along Minnehaha Creek through the course. Uh, during this time, this, these two years, a couple of events, significant events have occurred. The first being the golf convergence study that was conducted by the, the Park Board, which, um, which reviewed their golf course operations systematically and created a, a golf master plan. The second was the historic flooding that occurred in 2014. Uh, and with that, the, the Meadowbrook Golf Course sustained approximately $2 million uh, in damage. So in early 2015, the district and the park board executed a cooperative agreement uh, to explore, to conduct master planning for the site. Um, and after completing those, those conceptual uh, phases or those charrettes, a preferred alternative emerged, which was 18 holes of golf that was uh, um, essentially reconfigured to protect some of the, the, uh, the important infrastructure, greens and tees and things of that nature from, from flooding, and with that also address some of the water resource needs that we had identified in our cooperative agreement, uh, such as stream restoration, wetland and, and upland ecology, and things of that nature. So. Following the feasibility presentation in August and, and in accordance with watershed law, uh, the board hosted a public hearing on September 10th, at which time one resident spoke in favor of the project, one downstream resident in favor of the project. So the next step would then be ordering the project if you so choose. As you know, we're working on an expedited timeline to, to meet the needs of the park board and uh, their golf constituents and get a course open and running. Um, to, to do that efficiently, we've, uh, we've negotiated terms of an amendment to the cooperative agreement that would retain, uh, that would allow for the park board to retain the consulting team. It would have the district uh, collaborate throughout the design process and, uh, and then have an allocation of design costs associated with whichever activity it is uh, related to that design. Uh, similar in nature to the concept design process, we uh, each partner developed a consulting team that would work most efficiently for uh, for their elements, so with, with their uh, expertise um, uh, related to their issue. For the park board, it's, it's Herford Norby as their golf course architect and designer. And for the district, it would be Interflu uh, for our stream restoration and, and natural resource restoration. A unique element to this project because there are two components that are quite different when you're talking about a golf course um, architecture project or restoration project and then a stream project is uh, Wank Associates has been 
um, selected as a prime and a project manager for uh, for the park board so they can coordinate the, the unique nature of the two designs as well as work through permitting, um, coordinate the plans and specifications so they're into one package for construction, work through any uh, civil needs for flood resiliency uh, and things of that nature. So um, in, front of you, in front of you this evening there is a, an amendment to the cooperative agreement. That amendment does commit the district to incurring design costs up to $210,042. Uh, staff is actually suggesting a 5% contingency, which, which brings that to uh, approximately $220,000. Um, it also uh, um, states that there's a mutual understanding that the Park Board will finance both parties' interests in, in this project and that they will uh, they'll proceed um, in establishing that financing expeditiously. It does not formally commit either party to construction at this time. We, uh, it does state that in the event that one party were to terminate, um, we would work in good faith. If it were the park board, for instance, we'd work in good faith to be able to construct a project on their property. Um, and staff is committed, and it's laid out in the agreement that will commence immediately to, to come to terms with both the financing and construction for the project. It's just that some of those details haven't been worked out yet in time to, uh, to move forward with the design. So this evening, staff, uh, staff is recommending that the board does formally order the, the Meadowbrook Golf Course Ecological Restoration Project and authorizes the execution of the First Amendment to the Cooperative Agreement with the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Is there a second? Second. Questions or discussion? Manager Olson? Um, it, 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 is it my imagination or is this coming in under budget from what we were planning? Is there another? Yeah, um, Manager Olson, managers, early on in the in the process we, um, we put together some estimates based on previous projects that we've worked on and I think they, they were a little bit higher than where we did come in at. So uh, fortunately for the stream restoration portion as well as our portion of um, the, the prime or, or project management from Wank and we're, we're still coming in under what we had anticipated. I should note this, this doesn't con include construction right. oversight and some of that was included early on as well. Thank you. Manager, please. Uh, okay, so I heard you say that the city is going to find the design phase. Is that right? Uh, manager Blick's managers, the, the park board would uh, would finance the construction portion of it. The district has funds allocated in 2016 for design as needed. Um, I should also note we, we have applied for grant funds for this project as well and may receive funds uh, when you, related to that. When you say uh, the city's going to finance it, that means they're going to provide the financing, but the, li the, the liability is going to be shared you know, proportion to what the improvements are between the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board and the Minneapolis Creek Watershed District. That's correct. So we will have an obligation towards our portion of the debt. Okay. So, so we have in our budget the money to pay for design. In 2016, that's correct. In 2016. But then the where the money is going to come from, from for construction is yet to be determined? Uh, manager Blix, managers, uh, it, it's yet to be determined. The park board is, is uh, going to explore the financing options for the, to finance uh, the district's portion. The district has in our budget um, projected out a 10-year loan uh, at a, a, an estimated, I believe, $2.5 million, which would be significantly higher than what we expect construction costs to be. But uh, to, to help us or assist us in budgeting out over that, that next day, decade related to debt service. I see. But we haven't, we haven't, as a board, haven't agreed to that yet. That's correct. Okay. I see. Okay. And we have letters of support from the surrounding cities. Uh, Madam Chair Managers, we do, and sorry to go back to, to Manager Blick's comment briefly, um, mm -hmm. the, and, and I, as I noted, there will be a second amendment that would have to come before the board that would lay out the financing structure and construction oversight structure, so it will be back in front of the board again before any of that were to occur. But the general, the general agreement is, is laid out yes. between, between the different units of government, where, the, where the, we, would share the, we would share the debt load financed by the city of Minneapolis. 
At least that's the, that's the that's the intent. Well, we haven't agreed to that yet. We we, well, have, we, 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 we we in concept we haven't agreed in, in concept we have that as part of the MOU that we've executed with the Park Board. Okay. In concept. Yes. We, we, there's there's been no there. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been no uh, identification of cost, which is what would be determined by this. Um, yeah, manager Shackleton, managers. It, it would be in concept only. There, there has been no specific finance structure agreed to whatsoever. Just that the park board will proceed expeditiously to uh, to find and uh, a, a financing source that that can um, that can finance both portions of the project, uh, the golf course and street restoration. Okay, so can I just ask? Am I the only one who? Am I the last to know that we we're talking about? Taking on another loan, or no. is everybody else? If you were at the other meetings and, and heard the presentation, you wouldn't know. Uh, and you were you were there because this has been before the board several times. We've talked about it. that. We're talking about yeah, long-term financing, uh, similar okay. to uh, to uh, uh, Richfield project. I see, Mr. Whisker, and then Manager Olson. Yet yeah, to Manager Blick's question, um, Madam Chair, Managers, um, financing has been something the board's discussed repeatedly from the beginning since um, we were directed to start pursuing the Meadowbrook Golf Course concept with the Park Board. Um, I think the first time that you saw indication of financing was when we estimated capital construction costs and the board authorized the release of the CIP to the public. Um, and then moving forward from there, uh, it was also shown that way in the budget, and it was discussed that way in the budget. And then um, we've had subsequent discussions, and now it's showing up in the cooperative agreement and concept. Since we're on the top, I'm sorry, I had uh, Where does the 2.2 million FEMA money come into that equation? Uh, manager Olson, managers, the the money that FEMA has allocated for the project is specific to the golf course restoration portion of the project so it doesn't influence any of the the district's project okay. can you speak to the MOU that can you speak to the MOU and whether it applies to Hiawatha golf course since we've discussed engagement with them there that would also incur costs if we were to do something Manager Shackleton, managers, the, the current cooperative agreement that, that is uh, under consideration for amendment this evening is specific to Meadowbrook Golf Course. I, I was just broadening the subject beyond this to just say we've talked about other golf courses and if we were to do anything at that golf course that would also incur an additional debt separate from this, but to achieve a similar goal. And what that it that is correct. That there was there were not estimates or projections within our budget for that. It had just been discussed as, as that would be the uh, the next step. And that was intentional. That, that was intentional, was it not? Yeah, it was intentional. We we didn't foresee there being a project opportunity on Hiawatha in 2016, and, and that still seems to be the case. It's a bit more complicated, and it, it wasn't moving at the same timeline as uh, as Meadowbrook. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure that that was very clear on the front end. Manager Miller. Uh, you know, we're just. It, it seems to be a, a focus on golfing. I mean, this is not a golf course project. I, the, the opportunity is at the golf course, but we're preventing flooding in Edina. Uh, we're providing storage for the rest of the, of the watershed beyond uh, Meadowbrook Lake, and we're renaturalizing the creek. So I uh, just want to make it clear that we're, we're not helping the golfers. The golfers will benefit by a better environment. It'll be more natural, but it's it's got other benefits. And by the way, the the uh, extremes of the uh, of the population on either side of the golf course are are extreme. Mm -hmm. uh, on the north side, there's ten million dollar houses going up. Are on the south side, <coughs> and on the north side, there's uh, four hundred units of uh, of very low income. Uh, uh, market rate uh, uh, housing, so it's 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 really a, a very very unique uh, situation that we're dealing with. Manager Shepherd, I would just like to clarify my, my linguistics. Then I refer to it as a golf course because the property owner in both cases refers to it as that, and, let, and has expressed the interest in both cases to retain that use. And 
I think they're both fascinating properties because they're both adjacent to a lake, and both of them have a, have a, a stream that bisects the golf course. Um, and it's a great it's a great example of a partner who wants to make more resilient use of their property. In this case, both cases is golf. So, Mr. Heyman, um, I I'm not looking at the resolution. My package it wouldn't appear on my computer. Are you looking for action this evening? Uh, Madam Chair, we are. And the action being? Uh, the action would be to order the Meadowbrook Golf Course Ecological Restoration Project and, and authorize uh, amendment to the cooperative agreement for project design. Mm -hmm. And, and Metro Olson seconded. We already had a second. Oh, we already did. Yeah. Okay. okay. For the discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Heyman. Thank you. <coughs> Resolution 15-089, authorization to contract with Henry Rapp for Concord Supply Support. Ms. Christopher. Good evening, Madam Chair, Managers. Um, tonight's staff is requesting um, authorization to contract with Henry Rapp in an amount not to exceed $40,000 for communication support throughout the development of the comprehensive plan. Um, as the district develops its, its plan, it's important to have clear and compelling messaging um, to effectively communicate the district's new policies and approach. Um, staff has used the services of Himley Rapp um, in preparing for the kickoff meetings and preparing other um, materials for the comprehensive plan uh, thus far, and we'd like to continue to utilize their expertise um, through the rest of the development process. There is a proposal in your packet that includes uh, three areas of work um, where they'd be providing assistance. The first is um, assisting with the review and editing of materials um, as needed um, for the different advisory committees, um, as well as for the six mile uh, planning process that's about to be kicked off, um, and just other ongoing updates um, at certain milestones along the, along the way. We've dedicated about 30 to 40 hours for that task. Um, the second area of work would be providing support throughout the strategic planning process that the board approved earlier this month. Um, as discussed at uh, the workshop and the planning and policy committee, um, our recommendation is um, that Himley would assist first with refining the mission, vision goals, and principles for the plan. And uh, the process we've outlined for that um, is that they would first um, come to the November policy and planning committee meeting um, and discuss and provide um, some guidance as far as the, the purpose of the mission statement, vision statement, and the other pieces, um, and recommendations for what makes an effective mission statement um, and kind of what, what best practices are. Um, next, they um, would work with us to develop um, a set of questions and in individually interview all the managers um, to ensure that we're getting input from the full board um, as far as um, what should be considered in developing the mission and vision and goals. Um, and finally, they would synthesize all of, all of the input received and come back with some draft language options um, in December. Um, and then the last area of work would be um, for them to then uh, continue to participate throughout the program evaluation process um, to learn more about the district's programs and provide guidance, um, particularly in the area of community engagement um, and communications, um, just helping us define kind of the role and interaction of all programs um, in communicating to the different audiences and um, advancing the district's goals of community engagement. Um, and also in looking at how we are um, measuring um, our progress um, towards a community engagement that's been discussed as something that's a little more challenging to uh, define the outcomes and metrics for. Um, and again, uh, we're anticipating a total uh, contract amount of 40000 and uh, requesting approval this evening. We'll take any questions. Thank you. Manager's questions? Manager Blister? It seems like a lot of money to me. And so I'm, I guess I'm, my question would be, actually it would, I'm glad Telly is still here. I think she is. Yes, she is. Oh, she is. Hey, Telly, could you come up here just for a minute? I just have a question for you about this. I was going to try and calculate the hourly rate here, but um, I just was, you know, in the past, one of the things that we've we've done was to hire um, an intern or somebody to do um, work. Um, 
that you might normally do or something to free you up to do, you know, you or your staff at a, a more advanced level. And I'm just wondering, because some of this work seems like it would be really helpful to have some of you guys participate in and be hi more highly involved and engaged in, because I think it would be allow you to make contacts in the community and and um, and and learn more about you know be engaged in the process. So I'm just off the top of my head thinking that might be a better use of the money, um, and I'm just wondering if that would even be remotely possible to do. Well, um, Manager Blixt and managers, this um, this is a fairly involved project and it really is a question of staff capacity as well as expertise. Um, Becky has consulted with uh, education communication staff about this and we will be involved in the process. So it's not like we're just handing it off to a consultant to do in a vacuum. So definitely we will be involved. It's more of an issue of staff capacity and expertise in this particular area. So even if we hired an intern to um, help offload some of the capacity issues that you have, it wouldn't allow you to be more engaged in this? Well, potentially, sure. It would give me a little bit more time to be more involved in the process. But the timeline here is now. Pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and I could provide a little more context um, as far as the, the hourly rate that's used here is $300 an hour, and that's averaging um, between um, Lori, who's kind of going to be our primary consultant, and John Himley. Um, and most of the work uh, would most likely be done by Lori, so it would be a little lower than this, but um, depending on timelines, they might have to rely some on John, so they've just kind of averaged the two for now. Um, also, we do have a, a range of hours for each of these tasks, and so um, the 40000 would be the maximum, but it is, I think, likely that we could um, probably get by as we go on with, with fewer hours. We just wanted to have some flexibility in there to use them as needed. Okay, well, it strikes me we could hire 10 interns then. Um, well, we want to hire 20, <laughs> and then we can really have chaos. I just, I, you know, <laughs> I'm just... Manager Shackleton? I'm just, I, you know, I'm sorry that that wasn't given more consideration to because I think it would be valuable for you guys to be able to participate more in the process. Manager Shackleton? So I, I mean, I have a sense for how hard our staff work. And in my day job, I work similarly hard. <laughs> and I've and I've worked and I've I, I have I have worked with consultants and I've worked with interns and there's a there's a significantly different quality of work that is produced and there's a significantly different type of management. If there's any that, interns that, here, that, don't that, take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> that, that occurs. We don't have interns, really, Brian. <laughs> well, we don't have to teach our consultants how to do their jobs. We hire them because they know how to do their jobs really well. Um, I mean, using the same theory, we would not have we would not retain an engineer, we would hire some in, some interns out of engineering school. We want some really sophisticated communications to happen and we're not going to get that by some intern off of off of the off the college campus. Unless it's gophers. Um, so to that end I'd like to move approval of this. Second. Of this. Uh, Mr. Whisker? Um, well, just to speak to cost, I think it's important to point out, um, well, well, maybe first that there's sort of an insinuation that communications is inadequately engaged in the process, and I don't think that's accurate. Um, I think Telly will correct me if I'm wrong, but she did mention that we've, um, we've coordinated closely. And the three tasks are broken out. Task one is stakeholder communications. And stakeholder communications is all about messaging key areas of the comprehensive plan about how the watershed district wants to integrate land use and water management, which is kind of a sensitive topic area. And that'll involve preparing, um, that's not, you know, there's many more uh, key messages, but that will involve uh, developing literature, refining messages, and um, what we're asking Himley Rapp to do is essentially budget $12,000 over 13 months about a thousand dollars a month to refine messaging that we develop internally as a team so the planning team working with staff 
working with um, the Planning and Policy Committee and then working with Telly's expertise, we'll develop all those materials in-house. And we're asking Himley Rapp, as a renowned brand marketing and communications expert, to put the polishing touch on those materials for about $1,000 a month. So this is something that we've done in the past with rules. Um, I think it paid dividends there when we're trying to communicate technical issues to policymakers and the public. So, I mean, that's a board decision, but I, I think, and I think our team thinks that's going to be money well spent. Um, <clears throat> task two is the strategic planning framework. And again, um, nobody on staff, not to take anything away from, from Kelly or other people that have a strong background in communications, have the depth and breadth of experience and capacity that um, Himley Rapp will bring to the table in the areas of uh, strategic planning, marketing, communications. Um, and what we're asking them to do there is, again, work with a team, a uh, highly competent internal team and the board to develop the foundation of our strategic plan, which, include, which I think is very important. The planning committee uh, and the people that have been attending the planning committee meetings um, have stressed that for us to conduct very meaningful and critical program evaluations, that we need to get the foundations right. And that'll include the mission and goals and guiding principles. And so, again, I think that's $12,000 to $15,000. That's a 60-day timeline for an awful lot of work. And that's probably why um, it's going to cost us that amount of money, is we're asking them to deliver something that's the basis for the whole future of the organization in 60 days. And then finally, a program evaluation, again, is an area where they're going to be providing advisory capacity, not leading the work. They're going to be refining uh, material and work that's done internally. And that's, again, over a 12-month um, period of time. I think one of the, the dates is wrong there. That's January 2015 to December 2016. And so that's about $1,000 a month, and that's in a review capacity. So I think it's my opinion and the team's opinion that the communications department is adequately involved. And we're trying to leverage consultants in areas where they've got very unique and sophisticated expertise to maximum <coughs> value. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The board wants to hire interns. I guess that's the board's decision. Thank you. Any other uh, questions for managers? Manager Blix? Not, not a question, but just a comment that just to respond to, you know, interns, you know, that's a, a can be interpreted to be a pretty loose term, and you know I hired people who are um, uh, temporary staff, um, <coughs> but you know that I understand. Yes, we are not paying; we're not hiring um, interns to do our engineering. But you know, frankly, this is you know what's disturbing to me about this is is the cost uh, for what we're getting, and the and and frankly, we are. We don't pay our engineers or our attorneys three hundred dollars an hour, and and to me, you know, that's disturbing. We're you know this is almost you know almost twice the cost of our other consultants, and um, and that's what I find um, problematic about this whole thing. So, um, you know, I I'm just saying. I don't like it. I, I disagree with it. You know, it's too late in the process to do much else, but, you know, I just, it's, I don't support it. Manager uh, Miller. <laughs> uh, I support it with great enthusiasm, and I ran the Urban Corps program in Minneapolis many years ago when we brought in, based on the Ford Foundation, John Lindsay's program in New York City, we brought in uh, uh, dozens and dozens of interns to try to uh, expose them. Many of them just retired recently on the 35-year <laughs> basis. But uh, the only thing you knew for sure with an intern is they were young, enthusiastic, and inexperienced. He had no other, nothing else. Some of them were just phenomenal uh, work. Others thought it was, you know, a good way to, to meet friends and uh, have a social hour after work. You know, so uh, just because you use the word intern, it's not universal in terms of the quality of work you get. And this is not, uh, this is putting the, uh, the framework around the, the work, the policies we're de developing and the, and the hard work that the, 
that the staff is going to be doing with the communities and developing a comprehensive plan. And we're going to be spending a lot of money on that plan. We've got to make sure that it's, uh, people understand it and embrace it and, uh, and support it. And, and this is the, I think this is critical for you to do that. Uh, I agree entirely, and I was even an Urban Corps intern. <laughs> and I agree. <laughs> and look what yeah. happened. <laughs> Sooner or later, you'll change everything. <laughs> I'm sure they used nothing that I did. <laughs> Manager Jacobin. I was just going to speak to the to the, the cost. The cost for this this contract is not different from any of the cost for the for the, the principles that we've retained out of out of this organization for the last several years. The caliber of our of our communications, as demonstrated behind us, has is dramatically improved from that point forward. Um, you have been very supportive of every of every con every time we've we've attempt we've retained them for for purpose. Um, our the, the, the goals that they will be working on in this, in this proposal are more than appropriate. Um, they, I expect the same high caliber work that they've demonstrated at every step along the way. Um, and so. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Opposed. Three to two. My math good. One, two, four, four, three, four, 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 two, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Christopher, Mr. Whisker, and Ms. Malak. <coughs> Resolution 15-090, authorization to execute a memorandum of understanding and a round. Good evening, President White, managers. Um, I'm seeking authorization to execute a memorandum of understanding uh, with James and Jane Hess and the Pemtom Land Company to explore wetland restoration on a property owned by the Hesses uh, while maintaining the current land use, which is agricultural, um, and exploring future development potential uh, on the property. So just so we're all sort of on the same page, um, this this memorandum of understanding emerges from the uh, Lennar development, the Lake Town 9th development, uh, which came in front of you in September, um, at which time the permit was approved uh, to uh, build 99 single-family residential lots. Um, and we were also authorized to work on developing a partnership with Lennar Corporation uh, to do a wetland restoration. Uh, the wetland in question right here in blue, um, and Lennar development is just north um, of the property there. Um, it, it, excuse me, uh, the, uh, uh, pattern, uh, the patterns, the blue and the, and the yellow, is, is that a wetland or is that the development site? Uh, Manager Miller, that is the wetland. Okay. Um, this is the development, so the, the wetland that we are looking at restoring is just south of that development area. Um, so when we began working on uh, this agreement with Lennar and this wetland restoration, we knew that uh, land was a potential choke point. Um, we would need land rights in order to do the restoration. Um, and ultimately, we're seeking an easement over this wetland so that we can um, complete the restoration. Uh, so the Memorandum of Understanding uh, will enable us to participate in collaborative planning of the Hess property uh, with the Pemtom Land Company, um, including scoping out that potential easement, um, and will enable us to plan proactively with this uh, potential future development of the Hess property. Um, and in doing that, we'll work towards securing the easement to complete the proposed Lennar wetland restoration. Uh, so I can take any questions about this memorandum of understanding. Andrew Olson. Yes, um, we've, we've gone through this before and I, and I support it. And uh, one of the things um, that you're doing by 
taking the steps you're taking is uh, getting a lot of support from the people who are doing the development and the cities and county and uh, President White and I had a meeting with County Commissioner Milosevic this week and it went very well and they were very supportive. So for those reasons I would uh, uh, move the resolution. Second. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Yeah, Pantom, you know, that's, that's really an old name. Uh, they were the original developers of townhouses in the, and is, is that anywhere related to the uh, original Pantom, the current group? Or, uh, I know they were sold to Pillsbury at one time, I believe. And then, uh, uh, you know, Bruce uh, Thompson and uh, Clyde Pemble were the original originators of that. Well, who's, who owns the company now? Uh, Manager Miller, it's uh, Dan. Okay, some. Uh, it's Dan. Some, uh, <laughs> your good friend, Dan. Yeah, and he has a last name. Okay, I was Excuse just wondering. It's, 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 a real, it's a very small office. Okay. There's um, the owner and then a, a so principal. They and just bought the name. It's really just the two of them. Mm -hmm. Mr. Welch. Yeah, I actually have had a couple of different projects that Pam Tom has brought forward to various clients in recent years, and they, they seem to be, a, like Anna says, a small developer that is doing residential projects in the southwest metro area. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the names. Too good. I think it's too good. Mm -hmm. Two Dan's actually. Yes. Two Dan's. <laughs> two Dan's. <laughs> Dan and his partner. Dan. 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 Are there any other questions? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank they you. have the Dan's and we have the Browns. Yeah. <laughs> and together. <laughs> That's why I said Anna Brown. I usually say Ms. Brown, but I was distinguishing that. Um, resolution 15-091, uh, Mr. Erdahl. Uh, th thank you, President White and managers. Um, I'm, I'm bringing back uh, the, and I have a, a handout to distribute also that had uh, one, one missing piece of information that was requested. Um, uh, on September 10th, the board adopted by resolution a budget of $12,796,095 and a levy of $8,705,875. The, the board further directed district staff to develop a revised up-to-date budget consistent with the budget adopted on September 10th and reflecting a 9.93% expenditure decrease from the 2015 budget. Since that time, two areas of additional um, reduction have been identified um, with some cost savings to totaling almost $300,000. Uh, last week at the October 15th Planning and Policy Committee, staff presented the current budget information and suggested adjustments in context of the strategic framework uh, that had been developed by staff and approved by the, door, the Board of Managers. Um, at that meeting, the committee reviewed in detail the suggested program and budget adjustments and voted to recommend these program level revisions to be approved by the Board of Managers. Uh, the hope is that following the Board of Managers approval this evening, staff will then work together to revise work plans accordingly and compile all the materials to be available for public review prior to the December 10th public meeting and public input session, um, and then the, that would finalize the budget and levy for 2016. The handout that I distributed, um, one piece of information that was um, asked for is to kind of look one additional year out. Um, and, and these, obviously, whenever you do a projected budget, there's uh, assumptions and it's somewhat subject to change based on changing um, reality between now and then. So um, the, the numbers that we talk about here might be different from the numbers that are introduced in the spring when we initiate the, the budgeting process for 2017. Um, the, the primary assumptions here are that the um, that the the board managers would increase the levy five percent in 2017, and that there'd be a carry forward of 2.5 million dollars. When we were doing our analysis of kind of that the uh, gap between budget and levy over the last several years, we, we thought that, that that gap is is diminishing and going away, but we thought it was somewhat predictable to have based on kind of how projects go. Um, somewhere in the two to three million dollar range based on different projects that would be um, at various stages and have some some uh, carry forward that would result so that we're using that two and a half million dollar figure as kind of that that placeholder again um, that is 
subject to change between now and when we put together the budget for 2017. On the, on the flip side of the same page, you can kind of see the, um, the actual numbers that went into those uh, data points on the graph. Um, and everything up until the 2017 is the exact same graph and the numbers that were shared um, in, in the prior meetings and, and that we um, shared with you at when the budget was approved on September 10th. And I'll be happy to entertain any questions. I know that the, those members who were a part of the uh, Planning and Policy Committee last week already went through some of the attachments or, or the things that were in the packet in terms of how those um, expenditures were spread across different departments. So, And that was shared with Manager Blix? Yes, well. that, that was uh, shared with Manager Blix um, by email last Friday. And I, I'm not sure if you had a chance to review that. We, we did offer to, to have, meet with staff if any additional information would be um, required to. Uh, to get this in front of us, is there a motion to uh, approve this budget? Move approval. Second. Motion and second. Discussion or questions? Manager Blix? Um, so I, I did look at uh, the proposed changes, and I, you know, the, I guess the thing that I is disconcerting for me about the whole process are, you know, there's a couple of different things that, is that I don't believe that we have still yet, the board has um, sat down and had a discussion about what our priorities are long term or, or in terms of, and, and we've just kind of, I'm a little, I know that at one time there was some discussion about whether or not we wanted to continue forward in um, AIS protection or and lawn conservation. I just, we, those kind of, kind of big picture areas. So I, I am concerned that we haven't, as a group, been able to have that discussion. Um, and I understand that that may have occurred in the programs and planning committee meeting, and I find that also very disturbing in as much as policy. it should be um, policy, policy what, and planning. Um, that the operations and uh, programs committee should be having a chance to have the same discussion, but that hasn't occurred, or that we should have done it as a full board. And I know that I certainly am invited to attend the other committee meetings, but that's, it has been noted where neither one of us, none of us are obligated to um, be at a committee meeting um, that we don't sit on. And so I think the, the process to me has been um, hugely problematic because of that. Um, the other thing that I'm concerned about is just the looking, you know, we have, I'm happy to see that we have the projections and that we can <coughs> know at least in advance for um, next year, but I think um, given the fact that it sounds like it is the intention of the majority of the board to do everything on a credit card in the future or, you know, to go do everything in terms of having a, a current debt, I would like to get a sense of what that means for us long term, because I, I feel like I'm not sure, I, I would just like to have that laid out for us long term, and does it mean diminishing, um, you know, as we have a, crew, a larger debt load um, and that we have to pay off, um, does that mean that we have to diminish? I, I'm just not sure what the ramifications are in the long term for that. And I, I would like to have that discussion as well. And then uh, lastly, I have not seen um, any in our budget projections a, a sense of literally how much cash on hand that we have. And the reason that um, I, <coughs> I'm interested in that is because I remember uh, the first year that Eric was our administrator um, and he forgot to take into account the fact that we need to carry over for the first six months of our of our year enough carrying capacity um, to pay for everything for the first six months and um, until we get our first payment from the county. So I, 
I don't have any sense of literally how much cash we have in the bank and and you know I have a budget but I don't have a any any idea of what we have <coughs> on hand so that I feel even comfortable um, saying yeah this is great um, so so for all of those things I I'm just not gonna be able to support this okay Manager sure. Miller. Uh, <coughs> don't you get the uh, monthly uh, accounting from uh, Red Hat, uh, which shows the uh, surpluses in all the accounts in the, in the summary? You know, I get it, Dick, but do you think that I can understand it? I well, it's, it's just the numbers at the end, if they're positive or negative, it tells you know, how much. And at the bottom, it's the gross amount. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, every single month uh, for every account. And uh, I, I, I think it's, if you, if you spend a little, little time or maybe David can sit down with you and go over it because you you get, you get a sense of comfort and we've been using that for several well many years uh, to make sure we have a full understanding of where and the so accounts are. The, the, the thing that I want to see that we've always had in the past was <coughs> the you know when we had a budget in front of us um, with the full spreadsheet of all the line items um, it said okay this is what we where we, what's going to cost us, you know, going for the next year, and here's what we have, you know, in the bank in comparison, and mm -hmm. and I don't have that. So you read the spreadsheet, but you don't read the monthly reports. Right. I mean, when we did the when we did the full budget evaluation, and I had the full spreadsheet in front of me, and I I just don't have that right now. Well, Andrew Miller, the, the, second, floor? the second part uh, is to talk about credit cards. Uh, you know, unless you're different from the rest of us, you got a mortgage on your house. I, you know, I, I'm, you, 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 I'm not you know saying it's a bad thing. No, I'm just know, saying I want to see yeah. what it means to us in the future. I don't know. Well, I don't know gonna... enough to say I, I like it or dislike it at this point. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. I just don't know. Andrew yeah. Shackleton? I can I can forge the email from Nancy Martinson if you'd like. No, uh, I have it. Uh, yeah, the, I, well, I, so I I've called her. It's instructive to interpret the documents because they're they're lengthy. Um, the credit card comment I find just astounding because we have been in these meetings where we've talked about how we're going to finance things. You've asked many questions. They've all been appropriate. It's an appropriate. It's I mean, understanding how we would finance debt debt loads is is not. Extraordinarily I'm just looking at the I just want to know what the I want to look at the cumulative you know effect of it is that's all I, I that's all I want to see as, as, recall, as I recall that. that's been provided but I would defer to staff for that um, and you, you said you said earlier that you know it's not appropriate to expect every board member to attend every committee um, and you're, you're right you're not obligated to but every other board member did attend both the joint committee meetings, but also the other meetings. They may have been policy and planning and operations, but we were, we were faced with having to increase our, our levy by 17%. And as a board, we made a decision not to do that, which meant we had to do some hard thinking about where we allocated our resources. And every board member showed up to every meeting, with one exception. And that was because we have, we, have, we have a fiduciary responsibility to use our, our public resources as appropriately as possible. And I, I feel very comfortable with this because I have sat through, what, seven meetings, eight meetings, nine meetings where we've discussed this, where we've looked at spreadsheets, where we've looked at, 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 at a whole series of different charts. We've asked for more information. Um, we've, it's been an iterative process. And you, you chose not to because it was sent to a committee that you were not appointed to, and that's to your prerogative. And I actually understand your questions because you've not been engaged. And I think that that was a choice, and I, I feel very comfortable voting for this budget because I think, it's, I think it's judicious. I think we did not just cut indiscriminately, that there were strategic decisions about how to cut, and where to cut, um, and more importantly, where not to cut, <coughs> so that we didn't eviscerate this organization. 
um, but instead they're laying the foundation for something that will continue to grow. So I noticed though that you keep saying we, when the we really isn't the whole board. The we is the was the policy and planning committee. The the we in my mind was six of the seven board members who showed but, up to every single meeting that I was at. But only the three people get to vote. But they indicated, the rest of the members indicated whether they were supported or had a problem with it. And they had, you know, last time one of the members that was a member of the board voted accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think it, was, it, it represented consensus and full understanding and commitment to, it, to the budget. I was extremely pleased with the way in which the bu budget was presented in a much more um, usable fashion than a spreadsheet. I also, just as a matter of setting the record straight, we had many board meetings, workshops, joint committee meetings where these were all discussed. It is not like everything was done in a committee, whether or not everyone was present at the committee meeting. Well, that's inaccurate. Um, it is, we have a, a process laid out in front of us for examining our programs in a very critical way. The documents, the, uh, the spreadsheets or flow charts that our staff brought us that are going to lead us forward in our planning are just exceptional. And to piggyback on to the mortgage comment, um, when I took out a mortgage, I didn't know that I'd have an income every year, but I just figured I'd go to work and get that money. We don't know 30 years from now what our levy's going to be. We have no idea, and that's never been the case, so it's ridiculous to say that it's the case now. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. I'm going to vote for the budget. Mr. Whisker? Um, I just wanted to speak specifically to the question about financing because that, that is something that staff continues to work on and I, I can't recall, I don't have perfect recall, but I do believe that we facilitate a joint committee discussion about long-term financing. Uh, when we started discussing global policy topics for the foundation of the comprehensive plan quite some time ago, and at that point in time, um, the, whether it was a joint committee or um, a subcommittee, I believe the full board was present, and uh, out of um, that discussion came some sort of guiding principles that we've been working on uh, with Springstead and will continue to be refined and sort of be the basis of the next comp plan with regards to how we use direct levy for programs and how we use uh, capital levy as one-time spending for capital projects and, and, and not use capital spending to support and grow long-term program obligations. And that was highlighted this year in the in the budget um, charts, where we showed we'd grown programs and uh, spent down <coughs> one-time levy from from capital projects. And during those discussions, we we flagged that historically the board, the watershed districts had about a four million dollar average uh, capital budget, and uh, we had worked with Springstead, if you recall, to do sample bond runs uh, based on the the set of assumptions that we could develop a capital financing program much uh, similar to the one that we have with Hennepin County for land conservation. And in those discussions, we discussed that if you took the, the average $4 million capital budget and you reserved uh, $2 million for direct capital project levy for design and construction costs in a particular fiscal year, you would have $2 million left over out of your $4 million capital budget that you've levied for, for decades. Um, to support a 15 to 20 million dollar capital improvement uh, debt service program. And that was the exact same type of uh, feasibility financing analysis that we did to start the land conservation program that is supported with an average two and a half um, million dollar levy uh, over time. So in terms of the watershed district's ability to support long-term debt service for, for capital programs, we have at least provided that level of preliminary information. And um, I don't have, again, I don't have perfect recall on all the minutes, but there's a series of next steps that staff is working on with Springstead um, to develop um, both in the plan, the, the procedures and policies, and sort of the accounting principles around a, a, a capital program budget that would be separated from um, watershed district programs, half of which could be supported by direct levy for construction in a fiscal year, half of which might be supported uh, support long-term debt service, which would increase our ability to deliver um, capital projects in increasing scale or increasing frequency without increasing the levy. So I think the board's been provided at least some information in that regards in the past, and we are, I just wanted to point out that we are continuing to work on it. 
Thank you. Managers? Are we ready to vote? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Erdahl. <laughs> Resolution 15-052, authorization um, to execute an amendment to memorandum of understanding. Mr. Whisker. Uh, Madam Chair, managers, this one I think is hopefully fairly straightforward. Uh, the resolutions for action this evening to authorize an amendment to a cooperative agreement the Watershed District has uh, with Gateway Nowood LLC. Um, this is an agreement that's been transferred with the sale of the Nowood Mall property from Rouse Properties to Heitman, who has a limit established a limited liability corporation called Gatewood uh, Nowood. In the very original agreement, there was a soft planning deadline of October 2015, whereby which um, the city of St. Louis Park, the mall owners, and the district would have explored and hopefully reached a decision on an opportunity to manage uh, over 150 acres of regional stormwater instead of just the 37 acres of drainage from the Nullwood site. Um, with a lot of the infrastructure planning in the area and the sale of the property, we haven't reached a decision and the new owners and the city remain very much interested in continuing that exploration. The final hard deadlines for implementation one way or the other were 2017. Uh, this request to authorize an amendment doesn't change the drop dead deadlines for construction that were in the original agreement. It just provides more time and authorizes the chair to sign, um, execute an amendment, providing us more time basically into 2016 to continue working with the new owners and the city of St. Louis Park to figure out a way to get water um, regionalized and go from 37 acres to 150 acres. Is there a motion to approve? The staff, staff recommendation. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Questions or discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, Mr. Whisker. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, the next item on the agenda is um, 8.1b, which was um, the recommendation to have um, Ann Warfield come to our board retreat um, and use her outcome thinking approach for uh, a, essentially a team building exercise. Um, the board had asked, had made it my responsibility to look for someone to facilitate a discussion on the board um, for the purpose of working together better, and this is one suggestion that I have for the board as a productive way of moving forward with this issue. Manager Shackleton? I kind of beg the question of how important this is. Um, we have faced a deep budget issue and have worked through it about as respons responsibly as one could hope. Um, there has been <coughs> virtually no acrimony. There have been honest del deliberations we have we have worked together as one would hope a, a body would um, and I kind of I, I wonder what the value of this is um, I just when I when I think of how how an organization should function the last two, three months, we have functioned in that way. And I think that speaks to a healing that is welcomed. Um, I had uh, been working uh, email in response to your original email and your comments that you made at the last meeting. And uh, even though I put in a huge amount of time on it, um, 
it wasn't finished. Um, my initial response was um, not very good in that, and I, I don't know, I, I, I did talk to um, Ms. Wakefield um, to get her um, input on how she would envision this process would work and move forward. Mm -hmm. And I was disturbed by a couple of comments that were in the, um, the email that you had sent out. Um, and they were primarily, uh, one of them was that um, starting with a clean slate was one of them. Uh, and I understand that that did come from Ms. Uh, Wakefield's. Um, and the second one was a team building exercise. And in speaking with Ms. Wakefield, um, I, I shouldn't say that, I didn't, I have a problem with the starting with a clean slate issue. Um, because that implies that what has happened in the past would be overlooked and put aside to simply move forward. And I've said this before, I think that would be a bad mistake, mistake in the district to do that. Um, and not only would it be a mistake, it would be, I think, a disservice to, to the residents of the district. Um, I think there are some issues that do need to be faced and do need to be addressed. My other concern was the team, team, team building um, phrase in that I don't think team building is the answer as I define team building. Um, what the board voted for was uh, mediation, which is different than team building in my, in, as I would define it. Um, and just to stay consistent, I have consistently voted against mediation um, because I um, think if the board is going to face the, the problems that it has, and I disagree wholeheartedly, Brian, in that the district, um, the board does have serious problems. Um, the board also has a responsibility to deal with the issues that come before us. And um, the board has done that. Um, it has, however, in general, been a very unpleasant experience. Um, in speaking with Ms. Wakefield, she indicated that her intent would, would not be to start with a clean slate. That was not what she proposed doing, number one. And number two, that it would be important to truly have a discussion of the issues that are problematic for the board, including um, a discussion of um, the dismissal of the previous district administrator in order for the process to be effective and successful. And based on those comments, um, so long as she is not interfered with in any way, I have no problem with working with her. Um, but that does not mean that what she would intend to do is the same as what the board would intend to do. Um, <clears throat> so I think it's just important to say that, that um, there may be a feeling that everything's hunky-dory, but it is not. Um, and I can continue to see um, a, a board that is not willing to face up to those issues. Now, in the long term, it may not make a difference because there is a division of the board and there is a majority, um, but that isn't good for the district to have a, a situation like that. So. I guess the short answer is, is there are problems that I believe need to be dealt with from my perspective. Um, I would like to see the board face those issues and have a discussion about them. Um, but I am pessimistic as far as what the outcome would be. Um,
So I guess I would just leave it at that. I think it's important to, to say that. Um, Mr. Shackleton? A clean slate could never be achieved. I think to ignore history is, is foolish. Because everybody is, everybody is affected by it. Everybody is affected by the decisions that, that we all make. Um, and team building exercises at a retreat, in a retreat setting aren't necessarily the answer. But the counterpoint to that, I think, is our budget process. Where you face something challenging and you work together to, to, to get to an outcome that's positive. One. And we did do that. And we spent time doing that. And we spent time working together. And things may not be hunky-dory, but I wasn't appointed to this organization to have, to have a Thursday night club. I, I gave up a social life to join this organization. Um, I don't have to like anybody up here. I just have to work with you. And I have to work honestly, I have to work diligently, and I have to, I have to guard our public resources just as much as, as anybody else. Um, that's our charge. We, we have stayed focused on our mission, and that's all we, can, that we, should, we, should, we should expect of ourselves. Um, there may be serious problems amongst us, but those didn't come through as, we were, as we've hashed out all kinds of issues today and in the previous several months. Um, I, I don't believe there's, there's a reason to go forward. Um, I'm happy to sit down with anybody and talk through our, our issues, um, but I don't, I don't know that Spending money to have somebody come in is a wise use of our resources, especially after the last couple months where we've had to deal with a, a really significant budget issue and did it without acrimony. I've already said that my piece on that. Manager Olson? I think uh, one of the strengths of this board is that we're not a team. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And, and I don't know that that's the, the result that we would ever want to aspire to be because then we're just, we, 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 you know, the 7 0 votes are because what we're voting on at the time we make a 7 0 vote is what seven individual people want in their opinion as they represent their, their county. So I, I don't know that I want to warm up to be, a, you know, a, a, a part of a team. Now, in my business, we, it's very important to be a team player. It's extremely important. In fact, we let go people who aren't team players, but this is different. And um, to that end, I would make a motion that we don't do a uh, team building exercise and that we um, uh, not have the board retreat as there was no other agenda item on that retreat. And that uh, we have a future board retreat with new items planned for some time in the future, but that we uh, not have this one. I'll second that motion. Uh, okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I believe uh, exactly what you said. Uh, I, I believe in tension in, in all transactions uh, because you get you get better results. And I, I uh, not necessarily conflict, but different opinions and different points of views and. Uh, I think we should be civil when we're doing it, if possible, but sometimes it's not. <laughs> I understand that. But uh, I think we should just move on. Uh, we've got a uh, all the important elements of, uh, of our uh, interfaces, uh, the staff, uh, our partners, and the citizens are pleased with the work that this board is doing. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, we don't have to rehash uh, what's happened uh, last year or the year before. Uh, I think we're in a good place now and we should just move on. And uh, I, I don't think I'd go to a mediation or a, uh, or a uh, uh, team building. Uh, 
uh, because uh, the other reasons that everybody else is uh, is given. Uh, you know, we know where everybody stands. We know where, what's the cause of the tension, and and let's move the program forward. Would you be willing to make an amendment to um, Manager Olson's motion that we not only ha not have the retreat, but um, not have any kind of facilitated discussion? Yeah, I'll, I'll make I'll uh, move that amendment. I would second it. So I'm the one, uh, I'm the one, only one who hasn't spoken, and because I wanted to hear what everybody else had to say about this, and I will say that um, there are um, a list that of of governance issues that um, totally separate and aside from the issue related to the previous administrator that. Um, Bill and Jim and I have created a long time ago now that we wanted to have to be a part of the mediation discussion. Of, uh, that were, I don't know, remember about 15 items, would you guys say? Um, that um, we, we had concerns and issues with. And those are the areas that we wanted to have a discussion about. Um, and um, we haven't had a a chance to have that discussion um, and I think it's really important that we do um, because there are areas just related to uh, our, the work that we do together or not um, that we have concerns about and um, so that's why um, I really supported the idea of doing the mediation so that we could get to some of those um, areas that are a constant concern for myself um, and I know they are for Jim apparently Bill doesn't have any concerns but um, he did at one time and and that's why I still think that it would be important for us to, to at least be able to bring our those issues out and talk about them so that we could I think move together more productively um, as a result. So that's well, I would like to speak to the governance question. In um, 2014, the May retreat was about governance, and what came out of that were some specific changes, but also the consolidation of all of our governance policies into one. And we also brought that back to the retreat in October, which you did attend in October, and you didn't bring up any issues at all. And we made those adoptions in November. Now, our governance policy say we'll review governance annually. So I would like <coughs> a list. Um, maybe we can have a retreat that, uh, I'm brainstorming it, but a retreat that lists specific things that anybody is concerned about, not the governance policies in general, but a specific list. It doesn't have to be, um, um, all you can think of is come to Jesus, that problem, my apologies. It doesn't have to be, um, a confrontation. It can be a discussion of those governance policies. So I would welcome your suggestions. I wish you'd made them earlier, and I think that would be just wonderful. It doesn't have to be in the context of anything that might be called mediation or um, anything else, as far as that goes. I, I think it would require a outside facilitator, so that um, nobody, Let's work on. Let's work nobody on that. here, um, you know, that we would bring in a somebody who's not a part of... Would you sit down with me and we can talk about what those issues are and we can kind of try to think about what would be the best way to approach them? Well, I have the list. Mm -hmm. uh, Manager Miller? I won't participate in... in, in uh, I've been in three or four of these things over the years and uh, they were painful and unproductive. Uh, uh, I'm happy not to have you there, Dick. Uh, <laughs> it, it would be... It, it, would, it would make it go a lot easier. Well, uh, that's uh, le least I know where you stand, you know. And I, I think that uh, that you're uh, you are doing everything you can to uh, destroy the quality of the effort of this board and this staff and this agency. Uh, you do not have any interest in in promoting uh, the movement that we're making, the strides that we're making, the progress we're making, and you keep on. Uh, negatizing everything that we bring up 
whether it's budget or uh, planning or staff or consultants, and it's it's uh, it's uh, n not very productive. And uh, uh, I'm glad you made that last comment uh, because uh, I feel free to express myself for once. Okay. Madam Chair. Manager Shackleton. Um, I'm not going to support the amendments to the motion on the table because I think there, as Manager Miller has pointed out, there is healthy conflict and tension yields a good outcome. Um, we, passed, we passed a resolution as a board saying we should get a mediator. Since then, we had a 17% levy increase proposed to us, and we maturely figured out a way to deal with that in a way that, was, that did not exacerbate tension on our board. Um, we all have been present. We all know the history of, of how how we got to where we are now. But the important part about moving through history is to acknowledge it and to recognize it and to keep focused on the outcome. And we've done that. Um, I think hiring an outside mediator would be a waste of our money. Um, having said that, if at some point the tension builds up to a point where it's necessary, fine, you know, that, that, that back to the healthy conflict of let's acknowledge that there, there we have a history. Um, I don't see a reason for having a retreat. This was the only issue on the, on the retreats agenda. Um, and to that end, I won't support the amendment to the motion. I want to make one point of clarification and then call for a vote on the amendment. The original motion, which I made, so I remember it pretty darn well, was to retain a mediator or other professional to facilitate a board discussion. And when I was asked the end result, it was to work together. Now, I didn't, um, the suggestion I brought forth, I brought forth humbly and diffidently, I'm not touting that as what we should do. I was offering it as a suggestion that seemed to me a forward-moving, productive suggestion that met the requirements of the original motion, which I made. Um, and that is, so I, my, my suggestion, I'm not going to stand on the soapbox about it, my suggestion met the requirements of the original motion. Are we ready to vote on the amendment? All those in favor say I don't aye. Know. I, I'm sorry. What the, is amendment the amendment is to not have, n not only not to retreat with this suggestion, but to not have any um, facilitated discussion at all. But we would have a discussion. That was not the motion. I see. All those in favor of the amendment say aye. Aye. So nay. Nay. Aye. She's called for the eyes and then she hasn't called for the nays yet. Oh. oh. Those in favor? Uh, let me start over again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. 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 The amendment does not carry. Now we're back to the original motion, which is to cancel the retreat. Those in favor, say aye. 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 The retreat is canceled. Thank you. Man, um, Madam Chair. Yes. I really don't wish to, the, the motion was to not have uh, team building exercise, not have a retreat, but the That's retreat it. idea comes back later with different items possibly. At some future date. Some future date. That is not off the table. <clears throat> we will go to item 14, which is the um, administrator's report. Mr. Erdahl. Um, just in terms of a, a matter of business, since uh, we've conducted quite a bit of business this evening, um, and our secretary is not present because he um, he called me and he had some a procedure, some dental work done earlier today, and thought he could come but was not able to. Um, but uh, our council advised that I should um, request that a secretary pro tem be appointed to sign the mm -hmm. um, actions that the board has taken this evening. Um. I would move to, um, well, well, could someone motion, make a motion for the appointment of a secretary pro tem? Not that it be a nomination. Or no, who, who, 
Who's going to do it? Just yeah. to sign about five pieces of paper. I nominate Bill Olson. <laughs> five pieces of paper. I'll accept that. I second. <laughs> Those in favor of Bill signing, say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Board. Uh, just a few quick updates um, for the administrator's report. Um, one kind of relates to the Cynthia Creek grant application. The official period for applications um, closed last Friday. We received 18 final applications, requesting a total of $287,000 and change. Um, the total budget is $125,000, so it's going to be a nice competitive grant uh, process. Um, we're going through the rounds internally with staff, and then with the CAC, and then we'll make the funding proposal. We'll go to the board in December. Um, so um, it, the group of um, applications were, were quite good, and, and so staff is looking forward to reviewing those. Um, also, recruiting is underway for the Master Water Stewards 2016 class. Um, there's an information session um, here at the district office on Monday the 26th in the evening. Um, and just kind of a last fun little note is that the district's new and improved interactive map is live on our website. There's a link to it on the home page and you can um, click on the map of the district and, and several easy to access different layers of information about our projects, landscape features, boundaries, um, sampling sites, etc. So that's um, live on our website, which was a pretty big initiative over the last year or two. So. Thank you. Manager Olson? Was the elimination of Manager Shackleton's chair part of our budget cuts? <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he exchanged that on his own prior to when you were arriving, because I know that I, you I, are a big fan of these chairs, I, I know, I, because you mentioned that. I, I, sit on a yoga, I sit on a yoga ball at work. But I, I, have, I feel like I have a fairly strong core, Okay. but my yoga ball, ball feels much more stable than that chair did. <laughs> <laughs> at least it's intentional. There we go. Thank you. At this That's point, more information that we needed. <laughs> <laughs> at this point, we will go into closed session for the purpose of discussing the Keeley litigation. Um, that closed session will be conducted in the cat, uh, Arrowhead room. Um, Tom can stand up here. Catherine. Can the rest of you. You have to stay on. First, you can go to the bar. Just let us know where you are. Yeah, that one's not. <laughs> no, it makes sense. I, I know the answers. I just don't know the answers. <laughs> <laughs>